City Council's very first meeting of January 2019. May we have a roll call, please? Councillor Bettine. Councillor Brickey. Here. Councillor White. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Yusuf. Here. Mayor Marbury. Here. And we have three presentations tonight. The first is from uh, Y Durango Invest in Parks and Recreation. And Ms. Metz, would you introduce this, please? Yes. Good evening, Mayor Marbury and members of City Council. It's my pleasure to introduce our Vice Chair of the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, Anthony Sagastano. He was intended to be joined by our Chair, Rich Holheim. Unfortunately, he has a medical condition and is unable to participate tonight. So we do have Anthony, and he's here to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you, Council. How are you doing this evening? Hope you're enjoying the snow. So I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about um, the benefits of parks and recreation, along with that open spaces and everything that we enjoy about all of those things. Uh, this presentation will hopefully highlight the past and future investments in park and recreational recreation capital projects and demonstrate the tangible benefits of the dedicated 2005 Open Space Park and Trails Fund also known as the quarter cent sales tax, and the 2015 cent, or 2015 half cent sales tax to the city of Durango. You'll note that both of these taxes fund some very important things, and I think they go right alongside and apply to our comprehensive plan, specifically when you look at objective 21.2, uh, or chapter 10, objective 21.2, which is to develop and maintain a system of parks and recreation facilities, open space and trails that adequately serve the needs, to, <coughs> needs of the community. You also look at policy 21.2.4, which states to continue to regularly update the parks and recreation, open space and trails, capital improvement plan that inventories existing facilities, identifies proposed facilities and acquisitions, estimates, estimates improvement and acquisition costs and maintain dedicated funding for parks, open space, trails, and recreation improvements. I think one of the key words, or one of the key bits of policy 21.24 is that it states to continue to regularly update the, the parks and recreation and open space and trails capital improvements. Along with that, we have a continuing obligation uh, within our uh, comprehensive plan to dedicate ourselves to those uh, amenities and to those projects. When you ask why we uh, invest in Durango Parks and Recreation, I think it's because it matters. As council will see, there are a lot of different reasons as to why the investments in Parks and Recreation benefits all residents of Durango. Kind of a general, larger scope, one you can kind of look at, it creates a healthy lifestyle, something that everybody, I think, within this room, within this community, would agree they value uh, within this community. Durango is an active outdoor oriented community. Residents choose to live in Durango because of the healthy lifestyle opportunities the area provides. It preserves and conserves environmental resources. Durango itself, itself has preserved over 3,000 acres of open space for a total of 5,304 acres of parkland. In addition, Parks and Recreation fosters economic vitality. Events and amenities bring people to Durango and spur local tourism. I would also argue to you that it brings forward jobs, it brings forward companies that want to exist and live in a place that values all of these things. I'm going to kind of go down a, from a national to a state to a city um, specific uh, benefits of parks and recreation within all of those arenas. We have a lot of different, uh, a lot of different uh, in information points that we can point to. There's some that are going to be better than others. The city of Durango, for example, doesn't have a specific park and recreation uh, economic impact plan or impact study that we can refer to. We do have certain things that I can look at uh, specific to uh, certain parks and cer certain amenities, but we don't have a total. But on a national level, um, you can see the national. Recreation and Park Association released a 2018 report on the economic impact of local parks. Nine in 10 Americans agree that benefits, communities benefit from local parks and recreation. Uh, and then, and Durango's in line with all of this, just so you know. Uh, we, we match them um, nearly throughout all of it. So, uh, 
Park and recreation agencies protect land, water, trees, and open spaces, which improve air and water quality. For example, in Durango, Parks and Recreation Management is responsible for late night course, which helps protect water quality, drinking water, um, and reservoir rights that we have within that. Uh, over 10,000 trees are in our urban forest plan, which are managed by Parks and Recreation Department. Like I said before, that improves air quality, but it also contributes to the increased usage of local food and nutrition via fruiting trees, um, via uh, contribution to biodiversity, creating different areas and spaces where animals can live, uh, proliferate. Uh, there's also been studies that have shown that close proximity to green uh, spaces improves physical and mental health, reducing stress, high blood pressure. It also helps regulate water flow uh, and mitigates floods. Uh, one other economic impact to that is it uh, increases property values. Local park and recreation agencies provide crucial health and wellness opportunities for all populations. Um, some of those opportunities include yoga, fitness classes, gymnastics, sports, swimming, and more. Public parks are treasured resources available to everyone, regardless of age, race, income, or physical or cognitive ability. Durango itself has 38 developed parks that are available to everyone. Uh, I myself uh, think that parks imbue a sense of ownership and foster community within our town. Uh, I think they are pivotal to how we operate as a community and how we interact with each other. Parks and Recreation is an economic engine nationally, statewide, and locally in Durango. America's local public park and recreation agencies generated more than $154 billion in economic activity, and their operations and capital spending supported more than 1.1 million jobs in 2015. Park and Recreation amenities are the cornerstones to improving quality of life, a major factor in enticing employer, employers and workers to an area. Quality of life in Durango is, an impressive, is impressive as a place to live, work, and play. I think we can all uh, agree with that. Local park and recreation uh, agency <coughs> amenities spur tourism, generating significant economic activity. <coughs> tourism is spurred in Durango by visitors to the Animas River for paddling, Mesa Verde National Park, San Juan National Forest, and other local amenities, including our amazing trail systems uh, and our soccer complexes. The list goes on. Homes and properties located near parklands have higher values than those farther away, and homes are frequently marked with a higher, uh, excuse me, went over that already. Uh, parks and recreation offerings are not merely a nice to have a luxury um, as far as governmental services go. Parks and rec is a crucial aspect of what makes a city, town, or county a vibrant and prosperous community. Durango is vibrant and prosperous uh, with several events such as Memorial Day weekend, Iron Horse Bicycle Classic, Snowdown, all of which use park amenities. Park and Recreation supports over 200 community special events each and every year. Uh, it's important to kind of keep that in perspective. Where we're gathering as a community is our local parks and open spaces. That's where we are coming together as a town. <clears throat> Governor Hick Hickenlooper's office uh, released a report in 2018 on the Colorado economic impact data for outdoor recreation industry going down to uh, the state-specific impact of parks and recreation. The total impacts include the benefits of local parks and trails. In 2017, outdoor recreation contributed $62 billion to Colorado's economy. You can look at a couple of different things. We were discussing this in our, uh, our board meeting last month. Uh, you saw uh, a, the outdoor expo move away from a place like Salt Lake City because it did not value open space, did not value parks and rec. And it came to Denver because Colorado does that. It puts it at the forefront of everything that it does. Uh, it includes the economic impact, impact of activi outdoor activities occurring close to homes, such as picnicking at a neighborhood park, 
riding on an urban bike path or running on a local trail. Outdoor recreation supports 11,000 dollars or 511,000 direct jobs, comprising nearly 19% of the entire labor force in Colorado. Down to a local perspective, parks and recreation amenities are used by a vast majority of Durango residents. Durango residents utilize parks and recreation amenities to the tune of 92% use trails, 88% use parks, 74% use recreation facilities. These numbers were documented in 2018 with a st statistically valid survey as part of the update on the parks and open space, trails, and recreation master plan. Uh, kind of a broad overview, but it is important to know that it is statistically valid. Um, when you look at what we have been able to do as a community following the control, uh, construction of the $15.4 million recreation center. Durango has invested $64.5 million, $64 million in parks and recreation amenities since 2002. Investments in, Dur in parks and recreation include Durango Community Recreation Center, eight miles of the Animus River Trail, preservation of Horse Gulch, Over End Mountain Park, Dalla Mountain Park, improved river access, park and athletic fields, late night horse, and more. It's generated $16 million in grant funds for capital projects between 2002 and 2017. Uh, it's important to kind of think about that number because that's money that we would not otherwise we be, be getting as a city, as a town, uh, if not for what sort of concentrated effort we've put into our parks and rec. That's dedicated funding is a cash match for grants. Okay, so um, we are generating and bringing in money that is investing in Durango. It allows cash match, and cash match for emerging grant opportunities to continue to leverage city funds, allowing us the flexibility to match those sorts of grants when we get them, they are somewhat unpredictable, um, is, is important, I think, to the vitality of our Parks and Rec system. Like I was saying earlier, we do have a couple of uh, impact studies that we can kind of relate to. Uh, RPI Consulting prepared economic impact studies on the Animus River in Durango in 2006 and Lake Nighthorse in 2010. Uh, of those benefits, or what we were able to uh, evaluate from those studies, $19.4 million uh, is generated just as a result of the whitewater recreation that takes place on our river. 12.7 million it uh, was estimated to be generated by late night horse recreation area and i think that number is a little bit higher uh, at build out yeah uh, and then one point one million roughly one million dollars is generated by the durango youth soccer shootout tournament one of the 200 events that we were talking about earlier uh, that takes place on city parks or open space These are all voter approved sales taxes that we get our funding from. So parks, open space uh, are not a burden on our general, um, general fund. They have been approved by our city. There was a 55% approval in 2005, or for the 2005 sales tax, that went up um, to 70% in 2015 for a sales tax that was specifically for recreation facilities, parks, trails, pedestrian improvements and urban forest. Uh, you'll note that the, the 2005 sales tax included the library and Florida Road, uh, as well as open space parks and trails. So we saw a jump uh, 10 years later. Uh, there's obviously community interest in maintaining and growing that aspect of our lives. Parks and recreation is popular and highly regarded in Durango. I think that shows via the voters. Parks and Recreation provides affordable programs and services to over 475,000 people annually. We have over 1,000 people a day use the Recreation Center. We have over 65,000 participants in Park and Recreation pro programs. Game Time is the largest youth program providing child care opportunities after school and during school breaks for Durango families. It benefits working families. It alleviates pressures related to that and allows them to concentrate on their jobs. 
17,000 children annually use game time. We received funding as we were discussing a couple of different sales tax taxes. 2005 quarter cent tax and the 2015 half cent tax. Uh, they do not create a burden on the general fund. We get uh, roughly $6 million in total estimated annual revenues, $5 million for capital projects, a million for operations and maintenance of uh, recreation center, Lake Night Horse, new parks and open spaces uh, acquired since 2005. It's a good break to how those taxes are used. Um, as I said, it covers all of our operating costs. The recreation center are now Lake Night Horse and new parks and trails. I think uh, just kind of a brief overview is how we decipher how to utilize these things um, are important for the community to kind of understand. <sighs> to me, it's a better engagement of community uh, and gaining voice and traction as to what exactly our community members want and need in their community. Uh, it continually engages the community via a couple different operative effects. Uh, advisory boards, of which I am the vice chair of, uh, the Parks and Rec Advisory Board. There's several different uh, park, and se several different boards that oversee these taxes. Natural Lands Preservation Advisory Board and the Multimodal Advisory Board being the others. Uh, and throughout those uh, boards, we engage continually with the community, uh, either by allowing um, an open forum for conversation at the beginning of our meetings or having specific events to talk about specific uh, details of expenditures so talking about uh, something as little as uh, e-bikes on the Annis River Trail or what to do with conduct uh, ranges all over the place all over the place um, parks and uh, going to that parks and open space trails and recreation master plan is the foundation for everything that we do we have an annual review and development of the parks and recreation strategic plan. It's a five-year kind of guesstimate as to what we're going to be doing. We get new projects that come to light every single year, uh, changes. Uh, things are flexible, but we are uh, transparent with the city and with its residents as to what we are recommending to council at all points in time, and we're gaining their, uh, their input throughout all of this. At the end of the year, or from time to time, we make recommendations to city council on expenditures uh, and what to do with the dedicated sales tax funds every year. Uh, this ensures that tax dollars are being used in a manner representative of what the communities need. Future projects are identified through an extensive public process in the development of parks, open space, trails, and recreation master plan. Examples, I, I named a few earlier, but going back to them, Durango Mesa Park, Smart 160 Trail, Lake Night Horse, and Animus River improvements. Um, the board will rank and prioritize future uh, projects uh, based on uh, community needs, community, community uh, interjection, involvement, voices that we're hearing from <coughs> specialized groups. Parks and recreation is the reason people want to be in Durango. and, and our, a vital foundation for the community. It enriches our lives every single day and is an essential service for the city of Durango. Uh, Parks and Recreation connects Durango. Uh, I would just like to thank you for your time and kind of go thousand foot view of what Parks and Rec has done over the last um, 20 some odd years. You should have received, we sent a letter, kind of a packet to you guys, you should have received a couple of different things. Um, one would be a historical summary of what we've spent capital project expenditures since the completion of the, uh, the construction of the $15.4 million Durango Community Recreation Center in 20, 2002. Um, we've invested $64.5 million in parks and recreation amenities, as I said before. You should also have a, uh, a current list of future projects and recreation capital projects from the parks, open space trails, and recreation master plan that total over $290 million. Parks and Rec uh, 
Recreation Advisory Board also forward a kind of a, a position statement to you guys. Um, I hope that rang true. Uh, one thing that I would implore you all to do is think about why you live in Durango. I know several of you personally. Uh, I know that you use the trails. I know that you use the parks. I know that you're all lovers of parks and open space. I implore you to have conversations with your friends, with your family, as to why they chose to live in Durango or why they live in Durango. Because I guarantee you that one of the top five, top three reasons is going to be outdoors, access to parks, access to the river, out, access to, to open space. Uh, I think it's, it, it's an extremely important topic. We have some things that have been happening in our town. I'm not going to comment beyond what I'm here to do today. But, uh, these are all things that contribute to Durango in a way that are sometimes in, uh, immeasurable. Um, I think they impact us every single day that we walk outside of our door, um, whether we recognize it or not. Thank you so much for your time. Have a nice day. Thank you very much for the presentation to our community, and uh, we appreciate the efforts to e explain to the community and give an overview of the volunteer boards of multimodal uh, parks and rec, as well as the natural lands board. And our next presentation is by Levi Lloyd, a Director of Operations. And Mr. Lloyd, I'm going to let you introduce your topic, please. Uh, good evening. Uh, Levi Lloyd, Director of City Operations and Utilities. Um, I'm here tonight to talk about uh, the 3% rate increase and the Utilities Fund balance. Um, there are some questions after the uh, last uh, council meeting on what our actual fund balance was and where that money is going. So I wanted to uh, update you on that. So this is just a review of a slide that we had at the last meeting um, that talks about the rates um, and what those increases look like uh, for winter and summer rates. There's a 47 cent increase in your base uh, water base rate, 28 cent um, increase in your uh, water consumption rate, uh, 56 cent um, sewer base increase, uh, 94 cent uh, sewer consumption. Uh, increase and then on trash there's a 35 uh, cent increase and recycling a 22 cent increase and then we've doubled the rate for spring and fall cleanup to make that um, project pay for itself currently it's paying uh, the dollar fifty that residents pay pays approximately half of the cost of providing that service so we've increased that to three dollars uh, to make that uh, program um, completely sustainable so what does this add up to? So it's a 3% increase um, in water and sewer, um, trash and recycling, and then again, 100% increase in spring and fall cleanup. So for the average user, you're looking at a $4.32 increase in your winter um, utility bill. In summer rates, you'll see a $6.46 uh, increase in your utility bill. So I wanted to talk about the fund balances at the last meeting. Um, it was said that we have a $14 million uh, fund balance and that those 3% increases were not needed. If you look at this though, um, that doesn't take into account uh, the 58 projects that we have in both water and sewer uh, CIP projects that are already allocated. So if you take um, the CIP project totals, um, in the uh, water fund is approximately $14 million fund balance, but there's $12 million in um, previously allocated uh, CIP projects that are in, in the process now. So that leaves us with just under, or just over, um, under $1.9 million of fund balance in the water department. Uh, and then in the sewer uh, division, we have uh, $6.8 million fund balance, uh, but we have $4.3 million in allocated CIP projects currently. So that leaves us with uh, approximately $2.5 million uh, fund balance in the sewer department. So, you know, why we talk about these rates um, and we sort of get banged on that we don't need, we don't need these rate increases. Um, you need to make do with what you have, but uh, something I want to point out is that these rate increases are important because this is what um, gives us the ability to make process improvements to our, our assets that are out in the field. Um, our water and rate, uh, sewer rates have been held artificially low for decades because we have been deferring uh, preventative maintenance. Um, we've had very limited investment in infrastructure improvements. 
um, limited infrastructure um, investment in water treatment processes. Um, and we're paying for that now with a major um, plant uh, reconstruction. And then we've also had very limited in investment in our in-ground infrastructure and repairs and replacement. And just one example of sort of the big um, picture things that we have to look at in water and sewer is that you know, we, we have approximately 135 miles of sewer line and over 100 miles of water line in the city of Durango. And by conservative estimates, probably 60% or more, approximately 140 miles, um, need repair or replacement due to age and deferred maintenance. Average cost of the, that per foot is 150 to $200 per foot. So we're looking at $111 million investment needed in the next 15 to 20 years just for our in-ground infrastructure. Water and sewer lines that serve every person in the city of Durango. <coughs> so the American Society of Civil Engineers, ASCE, they issue a report card on the nation's infrastructure every four years. And in 2017, the last time they issued that report card, the nation's infrastructure was rated at a D plus. Obviously not good. Um, needed drinking water infrastructure investments in the next 25 years is rated is estimated to be one trillion dollars nationwide and 7.1 billion dollars in the state of colorado alone um, needed wastewater investment infrastructure investment um, is estimated 271 billion dollars nationwide and 4.7 billion dollars in the state of colorado so you can see that nationwide we we're, we're just like everybody else we've been neglecting infrastructure it's time to pay the piper. We have to make these improvements. We have to invest in that. And I'm going to leave you with a summary of, um, from the ASC report on Colorado's infrastructure. This deteriorating infrastructure impedes Colorado's ability to compete on an increasingly global market. Success in a 21st century economy requires serious, sustained leadership on infrastructure investment at all levels of the government. Delaying these investments only escalates the costs and risk of an aging infrastructure system, an option that the country, Colorado, and families can no longer afford. Are there any questions? Well, thank you. Uh, I'm just going to comment. We have a 65-year-old uh, water facility up at the reservoir. And so I really appreciate all of the excellent staff that we have that very tenderly takes care of that reservoir. And I look forward to, in the future, as a resident, for another water treatment plant. And I, uh, Mr. Uh, Biggs uh, presented the idea that they're out looking for land for a future uh, water treatment plant. So That's I, I really appreciate all of the information that you shared with us. So thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Lloyd, uh, that information will be posted under Hot Topics. Yeah, so um, of those, uh, we talked about the um, safe free projects that we have out there that, uh, that are currently allocated. We will post those on our Hot Topics. Um, it's a spreadsheet that we keep um, updated. Uh, we present it to the Utilities Commission on a quarterly basis. It's a snapshot of where we are in each of those projects. There's 58 projects out there. It shows if they're in design, um, in, in construction, out for RFP, or if they've been completed. So that will be um, distributed to you at, uh, as part of the weekly status report, and it'll also be on the city's website as a hot topic. Thank you, and I, I've already been to the city's hot topic website for the summary of the water uh, and sewer rate increases. And so if you need more information, just go to the city of Durango, click on hot topics, and all the information's there. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our next presentation is the Durango Police Department, a year in review. Hello and welcome. Hello, Please introduce your um, criminal analyst. Yes. So thank you, Mayor and Council. My name is Commander Bob Rammer. I'm the Interim Chief of Police right now. And with me this evening is Tessa Reinhardt, and she is our crime analyst for the department. So this evening, we're going to be presenting uh, the 2018 year in review. We're going to be covering essentially all the hard work that the Durango Police Department has done over this year and some breakdowns of some interesting crime trends and some numbers that went along with the year of 2018. So the first part I'd like to cover is kind of a differentiation between the two types of service calls we get. Um, so if I could direct you to the screen, uh, calls for service versus officer-initiated calls. 
Calls for service, those are when somebody calls in. So they call the dispatch, dispatch then hears that call via the radio most of the time to us, and then from there we respond. It's, it's being reacted to police work. So uh, that part of it is a majority of what we do. Uh, majority of, of the information is coming into us. We are strictly reactive to, and that's really hamstrings what we can do. Being proactive to calls, that's where the, the officers actually go out and they try to find stuff. And if they see things such as traffic incidents, um, citizens need assistance, um, going out looking for warrants, any of those things. So it's something that the officers actually go out and do themselves. Um, these are the statistics from 2015, 16, 17, and um, all the statistics for 2018 are just going through December 15th, because that was the last time that we put them all together. Um, you can see that we've kind of cleaned up, and so you see that officer-initiated calls are kind of high spiked in 2015 and 16, and they've kind of trended downwards in 17 and 18. A lot of that is how we are reporting our information. We've cleaned that up a lot. Uh, we, we've taken a look at you know, how we're doing our reporting options of that, and we're really kind of just getting better, hardier statistics so that we have better information to act off of. Um, and also, what we're also seeing is, uh, as far as the, the trends, as far as like how the calls are coming in, because the reactive portions of that, they'll stay pretty consistent, but they do go up a little bit, because our service demands do, do continue to increase with this increasing populations throughout the city, um, and also new trends throughout the state. Um, but it's given us less time to go out there and look for the things that we need to be looking for. And usually the quality of life issues are the issues that we would be proactively working towards, and those are gonna be issues that the citizens are bringing to our attention. So it's gonna be issues such as noise or traffic or um, vagrancy or whatever's going on across, this, across this, the, the city. And so to be able to hit those issues, we need the time to be able to do that. Uh, the nature of police reporting is also becoming more and more complex. Uh, we have initiation of body cameras and in-car cameras that are in a test phase right now. And we're anticipating that's gonna probably take another 15 or 20 minutes per report uh, to build down the video information and the reports so we can give that to the district attorney and to the defense attorneys as well. So those numbers are, you're probably gonna see in 2019, uh, I would say just even over the last two months, I think we were 50-50 on reactionary calls to proactivity calls. So it's definitely hitting, having an impact. Commander Brainer, uh, yes. that's hard to read. So could you read the numbers of uh, for 2018, please? Yeah. Um, so uh, the reactive calls is 15,687, and the proactive calls is uh, 20,194. So roughly 36,000 calls for service is what we're anticipating for this year. Mm -hmm. And so that averages out. We have about 36, 35 cops that actually work the street. The rest of them are all in support elements, such as detectives or command roles or uh, records, properties. We have different roles for different sworn officers, but since we are around 36, that's about 1,000 calls per officer per year that they're handling, which is pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. um, so part one offenses, these are very, very important, and this has been an emphasis of our work for the last two years. Uh, part one offenses are classified by the FBI. Uh, they set out mandates. Um, and they've started doing this a long time ago so they could have unified, unified crime reporting systems so they can start looking at crime trends across the country and figure out exactly uh, where problematic areas are. They've classified part one crimes into eight classifications. They're very broad interpretations of what each one of those are. So it's gonna be murder, rape, sexual assault, uh, robbery, aggravated assault, burglary, larceny, theft, motor vehicle theft, and person. So again, this goes from 2013 through December 15th of this year, and you can see the different numbers of how they get, how they translate across the board. Um, some of those have been increases, some of them have been decreases. Some of those have also been because of reclassifications of how some of the crimes have been redefined by the FBI and how they want things reported to them. <coughs> so I'll go down through each one of those uh, just for 2018 real quick, just to give a better uh, understanding of what each one of these are. Uh, the murder portions of that, we've had two reported this year. One has been solved. Um, that one was actually two accomplices, and one has gotten physical altercation, and based off the injuries, um, the gentleman died several days later as a result of a preconditioned medical condition that was aggravated by the, by the fight that they were in. And the second one is to continuing to be under investigation as we speak. Um, the rapes or sex assaults, uh, for those, so the numbers are a little bit deceiving. Uh, there's no statute of limitations on this type of crime. So these results can come in from any time period. So we've got four that were 
uh, previous to 2018 that got carried over and just were reported this year. So that's why that number is, is as such. The uh, robbery charges, uh, we four of the five that resulted in arrests. Um, and we still have one outstanding, it's still under investigation. And aggravated assaults, uh, the FBI reclassified some definitions when it came to that. Um, so it's a little misleading. Uh, everybody thinks of an aggravated assault as actually being a physical assault where one person puts harm upon another and there's injuries. They have included what's called menacing in this category. Menacing is just a physical threat against another person. Um, so that, that's how they, they put that into play. And 22 of the 54 in that case are going to be menacing calls. So that's about 41% um, on that part of it. And then so there remains 32 other actual physical assaults. 18 of those were against either police officers or deputies um, in the course of their duties. And two of those were additionally hospital staff. So 20 of the 32 were against uh, emergency medical or service personnel. So at least 12 against just the citizens of the city, within the city itself. Um, burglaries, anything special on that. Um, thefts, so the theft portion of that, that could be anything from shoplifting. Uh, they also classify uh, breaking into a motor vehicle and stealing something, which we call, call first degree criminal trespass. They include those in, into that category as well. Uh, 91 of those um, were, the, were that type of crime, which are first degree criminal trespass, where someone's getting into a car and stealing items out of that car. Uh, so the public safety message I have to throw out on that one is lock your car doors, because these guys, they're not, they're, they're not going in and breaking into cars typically. Probably 90% or greater. Uh, they're finding it's just crimes of opportunity and they're just finding unlocked cars. So we can reduce that by almost another 100 if, uh, if everybody locks their doors so we can steal your neighbors. And motor vehicle thefts, those, those um, we've recovered 33 of the 39 cars. And motor vehicle theft is again a broad category that could be ATVs, scooters, um, motorcycles, all those are included into that category. And the last slide that I want to present is going to just be offenses by year. You can see that the upward trend from 2013 to 2016 were peaked, and we've seen it slowly start to decline over 2017 and 18. And again, these are part one offenses, so those, one, those eight categories that I just talked about, but you'll see it come up and you'll see it come back down. Um, and this is pretty much the graph. If you overlay this with the state of Colorado, it's almost identical to this. Um, I only have numbers going up to 2016 through the Colorado Bureau of Investigation right now. But they, up till 2016, they had a 10.8% increase. Our six-year average, we're looking at about 12% increase. So it'll be interesting to see what the state reports for 2017 and 2018 to see if day two are also coming back down. Um, and that's really about all we've got for 2018, unless we have any questions from anybody. Are there any questions or comments? Amazing. Um, I will say that I, uh, I'm a friend of the Durango Police Department on Facebook. So I would encourage all of you to do the same because they post uh, a lot of information, very important information. And if there's some really bad guys out there, there's a picture and you can click on it and share. And I believe that's good communication for our community and our region. So I encourage everyone to go on to the Durango Police Department's uh, website, Facebook page and do exactly that. It's a, it's a proactive, and I believe in being proactive. So thank you so much thank for you. your presentation. Uh, with that, we are going to go into the review of the consent agenda. And uh, the consent agenda is intended to allow the city council by a single motion to approve matters that are considered routine or non-controversial. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member requests an item be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately. Items removed from the consent agenda will be considered under agenda item number six. Ms. Phillips, would you read those, please? Certainly. Items 4.1 through 4.2, approval of minutes. Sorry about that. 4.1 is the regular meeting of December 4th, 2018. 4.2 is the study session of November 7th, 27th, 2018. Items 4.3 and 4.4. .4, our final approval of ordinances, 4.3 is Ordinance 0 2018 amending Chapter 25, Article 3, Section 25-114 of the Code of Ordinances, City of Durango, amending charges established for sewer service provision by the City of Durango's 
Utility Department. 4.4 is Ordinance 02018-28, amending Chapter 25, Article 2, Section 25-30, in the Code of Ordinances of the City of Durango, amending charges established for water service provision by the City of Durango Utilities Department. Um, would anyone like to take an item off of the consent agenda? With that, I'll look for a motion, please. I move we approve the consent agenda as read. Second. Roll call, please. Councilor Brickey? Yes. Councilor White? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Musa? Yes. Mayor Marbury? Yes. And with that, we're moving into public participation. So I wanted to remind you, if you would like to address the council, please come down and sign in. Uh, you have three minutes. And Ms. Blake will be your timekeeper. She'll raise your, her hand when you have about 30 seconds left. And please uh, state your name and your address and address the council. Public participation. This section of the agenda is set aside for the public to provide comments or ask questions regarding items that do not otherwise appear on this agenda. City Council will not respond, usually, to questions from the dais. Citizens should address their comments directly to the City Council. Citizens wishing to speak during this section of the agenda shall sign in prior to the start of the meeting, identifying their name and address on the form provided at the meeting. Citizens will be called in individually by name by the Mayor to come to the podium to address the Council. Comments are limited to three minutes. The city manager, assistant city manager, will signal 30 seconds by raising her hand. And any audiovisual materials must be provided to the city clerk on or before noon of the day of the meeting. Uh, uh, Brian Blanchard, please. Brian, Mr. Blanchard. Brian Blanchard, 627 Louisiana Drive. I'm here just to support parks and recreation in general due to the fact that uh, it's always about the money and the money is gonna come from sales tax to support all these other issues that we have in our town. Uh, police department needs money, road and bridge needs money. It's gotta come from somewhere. And if you look at these smaller municipalities that have embraced parks and recreation, with events, tournaments, things like that for a variety of different sports, they're doing very well. The municipalities that have abandoned that and gone into relying on oil and gas or a train or whatever it may be for that municipality are gonna struggle. We have a tremendous amount of baby boomers <coughs> retiring. I'm a realtor in town, I've been a realtor for many, many years, and um, the one thing I hear over and over again about people thinking about or coming to town to live is either their kids went to college here, which is a big part of it, or the recreational opportunities. We cannot overlook how important the recreational opportunities are to our lifestyle, whether you all are really that active or not. I think it's 70% of the people who voted for that tax increase speaks volumes. And I think you have to go with that, and I would encourage you to not to touch the Parks and Rec money. I would encourage you to increase Parks and Rec money because that's where your money is gonna come from to do all these other things that we need in our town. I'm not saying anything is more important than another, but you've gotta figure out where you're gonna get the money to do these improvements. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Blanchard. Uh, Mr. Richard Brown. Hi, I'm Richard Brown, uh, 1770 West Avenue. I'm in my 45th year of shoveling sidewalks and uh, uh, being a really happy citizen of Durango, Colorado. Um, uh, I want to thank the, uh, the council for soliciting so much uh, comment uh, about the sales tax thing that just didn't pass and and all that, you really did a good job of talking to people and all that. But the reason I'm up here is that uh, uh, my wife and I both voted for uh, the, the taxes 2005, 2015 for uh, Parks and Rec. Uh, we voted for it because we really like what the city's doing with that and we think it's really valuable. And uh, I don't think it would be right to take money from anywhere else uh, take money from there to fund something else. I think the citizens of Durango are willing 
to pay for police department and all the other infrastructure things that uh, that we have and uh, it would it would be just as unfair if we wanted to do it in reverse or shift funds any other way I think uh, we said we wanted parks and rec we we said we wanted to pay for it let's leave it there and let's keep doing that thank you mr. Brown uh, Rick Cobb Hi, uh, my name's Rick Cobb, uh, 276 Oxbow Circle. I feel like everyone's stealing my thunder uh, because I'm also here to say, uh, as a new resident of Durango, moved here in August, we did that after coming from Boulder to visit Durango in April uh, and see, is this really where we want to be? And after working out at the rec center, right the Amos River Trail, horse gulch right from town, we said this town obviously has the same priorities as we do and that's why we moved here in August. So as a Three Springs resident, I'm now very interested uh, in making sure that the dollars that were voted uh, 1999, 2005, 2015, that are specifically earmarked for uh, new projects, open space, that they continue to be uh, used for that purpose. Um, and one of those purposes uh, is a smart 160 East Trail, because that's gonna go to our neighborhood. And as a part of Durango, it's not Three Springs, Colorado, it's Durango, Colorado up there. I, I'd love to see that connect the two different parts of the town. And we saw a slide presentation, $290 million worth of backlog projects that hopefully this sales tax will fund, hard to prioritize. Smart 160, in its current form, as I understand it, it's a $6.5 million project. They've approved the underpass under Escalante Drive, concrete trail up to the Three Springs connector. And if you had to fund that all at once, it's gonna be a long time before that happens. So I would love to encourage people to, to think about other ways to break that project into smaller parts. For example, 1.5 mile trail, if it's a natural surface trail, there's already a railroad grade there. There's already uh, a lot of infrastructure to be used immediately. Uh, Trails Unlimited says a natural surface trail will be $2,000 to $12,000 per mile, so 1.5. Say that's $20,000. All right, maybe we need some more easements, some engineering, a little grading, maybe a gate or a cattle guard here and there. Let's, for round numbers, say that's $65,000. That's 1% of a $6.5 million project. And yet, if you were to connect that trail, because for me, I don't care if it's natural surface or a commuter trail or hard surface. I want a trail. I want a connection. You could get 80% or more of the benefits for 1% of that cost. So I, I want to encourage people to think about a project perhaps in a different way. Can we phase it over time because uh, we could have that trail this summer. We split it up. Any questions from the council? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank Clark. you. Uh, Dylan Harris. And Dylan <coughs> is from Troop 501, and he's working on his Eagle Badge, and so he's going to talk to us tonight about uh, the Eagle Badge. Go ahead, Dylan. Hi, my name's Dylan Harris. I live on 75 Sills Lane. I'm 12 years old and I'm here tonight to complete my citizenship in the community merit badge. I have learned how government agency run. I have been in scouts for around seven years and, and I have gotten my arrow of light. My goal is to advance to rank of eagle by the time I am 15. I have had a lot of great opportunities to camp and hike around our beautiful town. I would like to thank our community for all the support they give the scouts. Thank you for your time. <laughs> thank you very much, Dylan, and uh, we wish well on your projects. Uh, Kim Baxter, please. Good evening. Sometimes we have to make hard choices between what we want and what we need. So let me give you an example. A family with children has saved for a dream vacation to Hawaii. 
looking forward to it for several years. But they discovered that the roof on their home is leaking badly and it must be repaired or else it will destroy their home. Therefore, they must put off the vacation to Hawaii and use the funds to repair the roof. Now, let me extend this analogy to city finances. The city council and staff have stated that we have wicked problems and not enough money in the general fund to solve those problems or to fund critical needs. <clears throat> As we know, city revenue can only be used for specific purposes. This lack of flexibility in the financial structure of the city makes it difficult to respond to funding needs. I would suggest that there is one area of flexibility which could provide a way to provide some funds to the general fund dollars for those critical needs. <clears throat> the 2015 sales tax can be used for park maintenance. Your 2019 city budget has $2.1 million of park maintenance coming out of the general fund. This $2.1 million could be paid for by the 2015 sales tax. At least on a temporary basis, the city council <coughs> could choose to keep that $2.1 million in the general fund and begin to solve the city's critical needs with it. I would suggest that the city council take advantage of this temporary option while working to determine how to grow city revenue without raising taxes. I recognize that some parks and recs capital projects may need to be delayed. I support parks and recreation department and I use and I enjoy the amenities that they've provided. And after this wonderful presentation, you can see it is a valued asset to our community. But I also realize that sometimes we must make hard choices between what we want and what we need. This is one of those times when city leaders need to make a hard choice. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baxter. And we are uh, making hard choices, just to let you know. We'll have another meeting of uh, January the 8th, and we'll be discussing our hard choices. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Simpson. Mayor Marbury, my name is John Simpson. I live at 1831 Crestview Drive. The previous speakers did a good job of explaining the benefits of continuing the high level of funding of Parks and Rec. However, we must address the fact that we need a police station and we need to address <clears throat> the maintenance of our streets. Please notice in that last sentence, I said need two times. It is your job to prioritize needs and wants. After the resounding no vote on 2A in November and the overwhelming <clears throat> input in the listening sessions, there could be no other conclusion but the majority of Durango citizens expect you to solve the infrastructure problem with existing revenue streams, especially as it looks like we're just completed our eighth consecutive year a positive sales tax, rep, rep, sales tax revenue growth. Even with everything that happened last year. The support for Parks and Rec is impressive. But I urge you to consider the 5,000 voters may not agree that every single Parks and Rec project is a higher priority than say a police station. A real, reallocation of the existing sales tax does not mean that no money is going to Parks and Rec. In fact, the solution to a police station be solved with a very small reallocation. <clears throat> Two months have passed since the election, and your staff has yet to provide a single scenario that would allow you to address the city's problems without a tax increase. Time is coming to an end quickly to develop a proposal for the April election. While it's clear that the reallocation is not palatable to staff and most of city council, you have an obligation to consider ways to accomplish what the people want you to do. In preparation for this meeting, I put together three options that will allow for the infrastructure improvement with no tax increase. The three options could be used <coughs> to 
start a discussion with the group here tonight on how to best out reallocate their existing revenue. All three options allow for the funding of a police station, as well as continued healthy funding for the parks and rec. <clears throat> Two options also include financing road projects. A clear discussion of these proposals would take longer than the three minute limit that I'm approaching here. And you chose to deny my request for additional time. And it leaves me no choice to not share these proposals with you tonight. But I will say, Kim Baxter's right on point that there's two million easily available from either the 2005 or the 2015 sales tax. You can use that to bond a police station. You can use it to bond roads. There's money out there. We just need to prioritize our needs and our wants. Mayor Marbury. Thank you. And Mr. Simpson, just and I, as I repeated to Ms. Baxter, January the 8th, we have several options as a staff we'll be presenting to City Council. Okay. Great. I'd look forward to the written comments to your three solutions, too. Right, just uh, email them to it, us. It, it, you know. I need 10 minutes for the people. Well, you can people. email it to City Council. Quite yeah, well, if you have those comments, we'd appreciate them. We will take them into account. It's going to take a little bit of explanation. So why don't you guys consider a, a 10 minute, uh, maybe at the next meeting? Um, please email your thoughts to us. Andy Cora? Hi, my name is Andy Cora. I live at 312 Fiesta Circle. Um, I've been a longtime resident of Durango, I think approaching longer than I want to know, 35, 40 years, something like that. I'm also a business owner in the recreational industry here in Durango. And um, I'm here tonight uh, because I've you know, been reading in the paper and then hearing through the grapevine that there's been a pretty uh, vocal contingent who would like to use our 2005 and 2015 Parks and Rec funding mechanisms as kind of a slush fund for the general fund. You know, I get the priorities change, that, uh, that the city has some real financial needs that we need to meet right now. But, you know, I will say I was, I was pretty integral in uh, lobbying in 2005 and 2015, and, you know, I've often bragged that, you know, what city votes by 70% of the people to increase taxes, you know, for Parks and Rec? If we look around at other communities, you know, when we, when we did that vote, I saw it more than just, you know, my wanting a bike trail or my wanting river access. I really saw it as a vision for this community, a long-term vision. And if we look at surrounding communities, I mean, look at Silverton, look at Cortez, look at Montrose. I mean, they would kill for this fund. They're, they're looking right now for that money to increase their recreational opportunities, to increase their parks and recs funds. And, and it's really more than just for the citizens. I mean, it's really the foundation of our tourist economy here. So, you know, my understanding is, you know, that money is not just available. There may be portions that are, and I get it if we need to take a look at that. But um, it's going to have to go back to a vote to the citizens one way or the other. I suggest that we look perhaps at some deferments, maybe some deferments in the 2005 open space allocations, uh, you know, of new acquisitions, of new lands. You know, maybe we can scour that budget and look for some of those savings. But I think it needs to go back to the citizens in any case. And I think we need to make another ask of the citizens, another tax ask. That last ballot was uh, pretty cluttered. There was a lot of statewide and local asks on there. And I don't think the city, or we as citizens who believe in this, did a good enough job selling it. So I think there's that opportunity. So I think if we show the citizens you know, that we have scoured the budget. You know, that we are looking to reallocate where we can to defer some of those things and make the, the minimal tape from any existing funding and therefore make the minimum ask for a tax increase that we have a possibility to pass it. But that, those, the, that funding is, is uh, a real asset to this community. And as soon as oil and gas turns down, we, I don't think, uh, you know, we should all see that coming. But recreation really is a future growth area. So take a good hard look at that. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, Anthony Sebastino. I saw that was a mistake. Uh, oh, sorry there. Thank you. Um, Ed Horvath, please. Mayor Marbury, Council. Uh, I'm Ed Horvath, 3101 West 2nd Avenue. Uh, 
disclosure, I am on the Parks and Rec Advisory Board. Um, I just, um, I believe that the citizens will support a ballot initiative for the police station and um, code compliance at the streets. If it's done a little differently maybe than it was done before, I really think it will work. Also, I, 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 I think when people characterize uh, critical needs and needs and wants, if you talk to people that live in Three Springs, they'll tell you that uh, connection uh, to the Smart 160 Trail is a need. Their park they've been waiting for for years, it's a need. Uh, downtown business people believe that the connection to the, uh, the El Camino connection to the Adams River Trail, it's a need, it's not a want. So uh, I, I just think, uh, I think a ballot initiative could work, will work, and uh, I would ask that um, the uh, Parks and Rec taxes be left as it is, what they're being used for now. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, Seth Fernie. So Fernie, I live at 11 Molas Drive, uh, Sky Ridge neighborhood. And you know, back in 2003, I moved to this fair town with a choice of anywhere in the country. My wife and I were both telecommuting and we were living in greater LA at that point, Pasadena. I said, okay, where would we want to live? Which is a, getting to be a relatively common experience in this 21st century economy. And we chose Durango because it's a beautiful place, great climate, terrific recreational opportunities, and it had an airport and had decent internet connectivity. There's a couple of other literally infrastructure things that mattered, but we chose it because it had a lifestyle and an environment that was incredibly inviting of anywhere in the nation. I think that is such a critical element of what makes Durango inviting and healthy. It improves the economy, it improves the housing, business opportunities, all kinds of things come of that. And I caution against forfeiting that advantage that presently exists. I am also, full disclosure, on the Parks and Rec Advisory Board, and I spend hours weekly just obsessing about this whole concept and think about it across cities, across the nation. We've done a phenomenal job. I want to applaud you know, the city, and I encourage you to retain that, uh, that kind of moniker of success. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your participation tonight under public participation. I, I think everyone that signed up has had an opportunity to speak. So we're going to move to a different section. Could I ask oh, a yes, question sir. of the city attorney? Oh, yes, sir. Um, the assertion has been made that we could reallocate $2 million worth of funds from the 2015 sales tax for parks and recreation maintenance. It's my understanding that that money is available only for new projects. Well, actually, or projects that have been done with that with the 2015 money. I, I think that a, a broad reading of the language says all recreational opportunities. I, you know, one assuming that this is something council wants to pursue, rather than opining on that right now, I would suggest that we speak to the bond council who was involved in drafting the language at that time and and give the council a report on that on that opinion. I think a broad reading of it on the face of it would indicate that, that those funds could be used for any recreational use. They're, they're not tied uh, specifically to a date, but I, I'd be happy to provide some more information to council on that. Before and I think during our January 8th study session, uh, staff is presenting all of the options from A to Z. And so uh, they have been working on those <coughs> presentations. And if you would like to attend that study session, you're more than welcome. It begins at 4 o'clock in this chamber, and staff will have presentations for the city council. And yes, we do make hard decisions. And not everyone is always happy with the decisions. Uh, you know, pick a topic. But uh, we base up our decisions on information, staff research, public input, your input, and the boards and commissions input. So the buck stops here, as they say. And uh, we'll continue and with our quasi-judicial hearings. Thank you all for coming tonight. 
And uh, if you have signed up for any of the public hearings, be sure that your names are down there. Uh, this is a quasi-judicial. Oh, legislative and policy debate. Oh, did I? I skipped it. Sure did. Thank you. My computer skipped Thanks, it. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Okay, we'll give them a moment to um, exit from the council chambers. <laughs> so, um, legislative and policy public hearings. The City Council, uh, we will begin with a presentation of facts by the staff. 8.1.1 is a public hearing to consider an amendment to section Please. 1517, 1520, and 1534 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Durango related to the court cost imposition of surcharge, surcharge assessed in municipal court and compensation. And so um, I will have staff present, please. Absolutely. Mayor Marbury, City Council. This is a public hearing. It is for the purpose of allowing City Council to consider amendment, amendments to sections 1517, 1520, and 1534 of the Code of Ordinances for the City of Durango. In 2014, the City Council held a public hearing to consider an amendment to Chapter 15 to consider an increase to the municipal court cost fee. During the 2019 budget discussions, City Council supported the increase of court cost fees from $18 to $25. The increase in fee will produce approximately $10,000 in additional revenue for the general fund and to help defray the cost of processing court cases through municipal court. Staff is recommending to change the allowable cost to $25, allowing for section 15-17 to read court costs would be amended to reflect a court cost fee of $25. Section 1520. In May of 2009, the City Council held a public hearing to consider an amendment to Chapter 15 of the Code of Ordinances, adding a new Section 15-20, which imposed a mandatory $5 surcharge on all cases where the defendant was found guilty, pled guilty, pled nolo contendere, or was granted a deferred sentence in judgment. The purpose of the sur surcharge was to raise revenues for the compensation of school crossing guards. The Council adopted the proposed amendments through passage and approval of Ordinance O-2009-11. As revenues grew, Council held a public hearing on July 16, 2013 to consider an amendment to Chapter 15-20 using the excess funds to fund the school resource officers. The Council adopted this proposed amendment through passage and approval of Ordinance O-2013-13. During the 2014 budget cycle meetings, Council supported the increase of the court surcharge from $5 to $8 to support bus bus operations as a community support funding. These funds would be retained by the city of Durango and would be used to offset operating costs of the Durango bus bus operations within the city limits of Durango. The bus bus operations transitioned to the private industry during 2018. During the 2019 budget discussions, city council supported the increase of a court surcharge from $8 to $16 to continue to support the school crossing guard program and to continue to support the school resource officers with the remaining collection of these funds. <coughs> court surcharge revenues have declined since 2014. In 2013, court surcharge revenue produced about 24,116 in revenue. In 2018, the surcharge produced only $12,650. The school crossing guard program currently cost about $12,500 a year to run. Staff is recommending the increase in the court surcharge from $8 to $16 to continue to fund that school crossing guard program and to fund a portion of the school resource officer program as well. Section 1534, um, the budget compensation process needs to be updated in the current code to follow um, current practices. Right now, the municipal court judges are not employees. They are contracted, um, and it, so the code needs to be update to, updated to um, to model what we currently are doing um, with it, with paying the municipal court judges. Um, so we are, are recommending this amendment to section 1534 to reflect the current practices with regard to that compensation of the municipal court judges. The fiscal impact, municipal court cost fee revenues will in, be increased by approximately 10,000 if the increase from 18 to 25 were to be approved and adopted with the proposed amendment. Municipal court surcharge revenues 
will be increased by approximately $12,500 in revenue if it was increased from $8 to $16 and adopted and proposed. Um, it is the recommendation of staff tonight um, to direct the city attorney to prepare an ordinance amending sections 15-17, 15-20, and 15-34 of the Code of Ordinance of the City of Durango. And I wanted to show, I'm sorry, I wanted to show a few highlights of what, oh, what's wrong on the slide? Yep, go ahead. Okay. That's for the next one. Okay, um, I'm going to open the public testimony. I have Maura Compton. Maura Compton? I think she was, she was here. I think she probably signed up for the wrong one. <coughs> okay, I will, seeing none, would anyone like to testify? Seeing no one, I'm going to close the public testimony. Any questions by council? I will look for a motion, please. I move we direct the city attorney to prepare an ordinance amending, sec amending sections 15-17, 15-20, and 15-34 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Durango to be introduced at the January 16th, 2019 City Council meeting. I'll second. Roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem Yusuf? Yes. Councillor Wye? Yes. Councillor Bricky? Yes. Mayor Marbury? Yes, thank you. 8.1.2, a public hearing to consider an amendment to section 25.134 of the Code of Ordinances regarding the utility refund program. And Ms. Brown, there was some comment last uh, at City Council a few weeks ago, and so this will be just great information. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Um, so this is a public hearing to consider an amendment to section 25-134 of, of the Code of Ordinances regarding the utility refund program. This program was first enacted by ordinance in 1983 to entitle qualifying user for users of the city water and sewer utilities to refunds against charges made during a fiscal year. The program was enacted for a purpose of making refunds to certain qualifying low-income residential homeowners for purposes of making more equitable the burden placed upon them by the city sorry <coughs> by the city's charges for water <coughs> sewer and sanitation services at the time of the adoption of the ordinance <coughs> the annual um, income levels were established to be used as one of the criteria to determine whether a refund was due. During the 2019 budget discussions, City Council supported the change to application requirements <coughs> to ease the burden on the applicants. It is appropriate currently to consider an amendment to the code section to the qualification requirements. Currently, there are five utility refund requirements. The first one being that the applicant must own a residential home that is served by city utilities and reside in each residential home on December 31st of the year <coughs> for which the refund is being claimed. The applicant must have occupied and owned the property which was subject to the city utility charges for at least 10 months of the year for which the refund is being claimed. The third one, the applicant must establish they have, been claimed, have not been claimed as a dependent on anyone else's federal income tax return. <coughs> Fourth, if the applicant is applying for a family, the application must list all family members and identify related income for each family member. <coughs> and the fifth requirement is the applicant's family income during the year for which the refund is claimed must be no greater than 50% of the area medium family income for La Plata County by family size as published by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development or its successor agency for the most recent year. <coughs> Staff recommends removing qualification number three as, a, as listed to alleviate the burden on the application process. The purpose of the program is to make refunds to cer certain qualifying low income residential homeowners for purposes of making more equitable the burden placed upon them. In 2015, the city issued 25 utility refunds in the amount of $4,665. In 2018, 38 refunds were issued in the amount of $8,035. The city continues to increase exposure of the refund program to the citizens. Applications are provided to the senior center where the staff and volunteers help people complete the application. 
News releases are issued. A message is included on the utility billing statement. There are printed copies available at City Hall, and the applications are available on the city's website. <coughs> uh, the 2019 utility refund amounts for um, the different classifications that we have, um, if you have one member, family member, total income is 27,500 or below, your utility <coughs> refund amount would be $176. Two members, the income is 31,400. The utility refund is 300. Three members of that family, the income is 35,350. The utility refund amount is $340. And if you have four or more, that total income is $39,250. Or the refund amount would be 395. To show a little history on the utility refund program, in 2015, as I mentioned, we had a total of 25 refunds in the amount of 4,665. In 2016, we had 25 refunds again in the amount of 5,095. 2017, we had 32 um, refunds in the amount of 5,965. And in 2018, we had 38 total um, refunds in the amount of $8,035. The fiscal impact, easing application requirements could potentially increase the number of qualified applicants. At the height of the utility youth refund program, the city refunded various amounts to the 38 applicants in the amount of 8,035. The refunds are paid from the general fund. And it is the recommendation of the city manager and the finance director that the city council by motion direct the city attorney to prepare an ordinance amending section 25-134 of the Code of Ordinance of the City of Durango for the Utility Refund Program. Thank you, Ms. <coughs> Brown, and thank you for getting through that. There's no one that signed up for this public hearing, so I'm going to close the public testimony. Are there any questions by City Council? I have uh, one question that occurred to me as uh, Ms. Brown was reading through. Um, <coughs> the phrase, own a residential home, uh, seems obvious enough, but um, there are some individuals who have placed their home in trust uh, for estate planning reasons. Um, I know that, uh, you know, it just strikes me that, you know, if the ordinance is being revised, it would be worthwhile to uh, amend the language so that those individuals are not excluded. Is that uh, possible? I, sure. think, I think we uh, we do issue those refunds to those that that okay. group of folks. Right yeah, because uh, it's you know <coughs> that happens to be something that has happened to me, and I've um, the uh, property tax rebate that the county gives to seniors. Um, I said, oh gee, our homes and trust we don't count, and then I discovered we do. Okay. So I think yeah, this you know it's a, it's a technicality, but. Uh, I wouldn't want it to hold somebody back, especially if they would otherwise qualify. Absolutely, we're um, we work with those individuals to do anything we can. We try not to turn any of those applications away. Mm -hmm. So as long as they you know can show proof that you know that is their it's in their trust and that they live there and they show all the other requirements, we are pretty work with them. And uh, I think it's I think particularly <coughs> given the fact that we have increased our utility rates so so steeply over the last few years, this program is really important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we were brainstorming today about another place to put the applications at the transit center. Absolutely, we could. So we look at, you know, as we look at different areas each year. Um, we have tried them at the library in the past, and not very many people pick them on. So we have not put them out there the last couple of years. We can try the transit center. We can try the library again. Um, but we can try and get that out there. I think that'd be great. We were talking about the library <coughs> the transit centers, more places where uh, families might be uh, going and finding that information. Since there are no more, I would oh, just yes, make sir. one further observation. I would like to compliment Ms. Baxter, uh, who brought the possible complication of the application form to our attention, and that came that, that provided us the, the sort of the incentive to include it in City Council priority discussion in November, and here we are. And here we are. And thanks, yeah. thanks to staff for just jumping on it. Thank you. <clears throat> Ready for motion? I'll, I'll look for a motion. Yes, please. I direct the city attorney to prepare an ordinance amending section 25-134 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Durango for the Utility Refund Program to in, be introduced at the January 16, 2019 City Council meeting. Second. And uh, roll call, please. Councillor Bricky? Yes. Councillor Yusuf? Yes. Councillor Wye? Yes. Mayor Marbury? Yes. 
Moving into 8.1.3, a public hearing to consider an amendment to section 2372 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Durango regarding the food tax rebate program. If you're not okay, <laughs> okay. Ms. Blake can read I'll it. try and get through this one. Okay. Fighting off a of cough here. So this is a public hearing to consider an amendment to section 23-72 of the Code of Ordinances. The City Council established a food tax rebate program for the City of Durango residents in 2005 for citizens that meet certain income and residency qualifications. The purpose of the program is to attempt to mitigate the effects on low-income families of the estimated sales tax paid on the purchase of food for home consumption. The rebate program was contingent on the passage of the half-cent sales and use tax increase voted on at the April 5, 2005 election. The rebate program is paid from the general fund. The program is patterned after other municipal programs in Colorado, and the major concepts incorporated in the program are as follows. Applicants must reside in the city of Durango for the entire 12-month period for which a rebate is requested. Proof of residency will be required in the application process. The applicant must file by family, listing all family members and related income. An individual can qualify as a family with one member as long as they are not claimed as a dependent on someone else's tax return. The applicant's family income during the year for which the rebate is requested must be no greater than 50% of the median family income for La Plata County for family size as published by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. The rebate amount should be based upon food for home, home consumption expenditures as published by the U.S. Department of Labor Bureau of Labor Statistics for consumer expenditures by size of family or unit. For 2017, that amount was $2,323 for one person and $6,194 for four persons. Allow, applying the city's level of taxation of 3%, that would calculate into a rebate of approximately $70 per person. The administration of the program shall be by the city manager as designated representative. It shall be developed rebate application forms spec specifying attachments such as without limitation, income tax forms and other proof of income and residency, adjust qualifying income levels and rebate amounts as required, adopt rules and regulations consistent with the provisions of the ordinance, and shall audit and verify the applications submitted. The first rebate period for the program was January 1, 2006 through December 31, 2006. The program has been available for each year since 2006. During the 2019 budget discussions, City Council was supportive of changes to the application requirements to ease the burden of the, on the applicants. It is appropriate, appropriate currently to consider amendment to the code section to the qualification, qualification requirements. There are four qualification requirements for this rebate program. It must be a full-time resident within the city limits for 12 months of the year for which the rebate is being claimed. You must list all your family members and identify related income for each family member. The applicant must establish they have not been claimed as a dependent on anyone else's federal income tax return. And the applicant's family income during the year must be no greater than 50% of the area median family income for La Plata County by family size. Staff recommends removing the third qualification listed, listed to alleviate the burden on the application process. The purpose of the program is to attempt to mitigate the effects on low-income families and fixed-income households of the estimated sales tax paid on the purchase of food for home, home consumption. <clears throat> um, the 2019 food tax rebates amounts are, if you're one member, t total income of 27500 or less is $70. Two members, 31400 income level, and food tax rebate amount of $135. Three members, $35,350 of income and a refund of $155. And four more, $39,250 income with a ref uh, rebate amount of $186. In 2015, the city issued 100, or 2015, we issued 140 tax rebates in the amount of $7,515. In 2018, 155 rebates were issued in the amount of 20,800. The city continues to increase, increase exposure of the rebate program to the citizens. Applications, again, are provided to the senior center where the staff and volunteers help those seniors complete the application. News releases are issued. A message is included on the utility billing statement. Printed copies are available at City Hall and the applications are available online at the city's website. The fiscal impact, again, easing application requirements could potentially increase the number of qualified applicants. At the height of the food tax rebate program, the city rebated various amounts 
to 155 applicants in the amount of 20,800. The rebates are paid from the general fund. It is a recommendation of the city manager, myself, that the city council by motion direct the city attorney to prepare an ordinance amending section 23-72 of the code of ordinances of the city of Drango for the food tax rebate program. Uh, I will open the public testimony, but I don't believe anyone signed up to speak, so I'm gonna close the public testimony and ask for questions from city council. I have an idea. Uh, Ms. Brown, we know that the elementary schools have free and reduced lunch programs. We also, the city of Durango also provides um, bus passes for students that receive free and reduced lunches. I would like to see that form go to the elementary schools and be attached, uh, be given to the, the families who sign up for free and reduced and, and we have been in contact with the school district on those type of programs. Okay. Where it, the problem is, is our application process is starting once this ador ordinance is adopted and a couple, you know, by the end of the month. Mm -hmm. They start that process in the summertime. So the applications don't go out at the same time. We have been in contact with the coordinator to see if they can get that word out somehow, but their application goes out at a totally different time than we do. But they're already qualified. They've already submitted paperwork and have been uh, different paperwork. They have different requirements, unfortunately. Right. Um, we, like I said, we have been in contact with them in the last month to talk through those um, and see what we can do there as a partnership. Okay, that, that's uh, where I would like to see that <coughs> at the high school as well as the middle schools, is because they're already in the system, right? And it's just a matter of giving that, you know, giving the paper and taking it home. So that's another idea of a place. Uh, are they at the library, for example? But they are not, but we'll try them again. We tried them a couple years ago, and nobody picked any up. So That's we'll okay. try it again. Let's keep yeah. trying. Yeah. And the same thing at the transit, transit center. center. Okay. And, and the transit center low and reduced um, pass also has this requirement that we are suggesting to change on the food tax and utility refund program. So we're looking at changing that as well on the transit so that we can okay. help with that. Um, I meet with the, <coughs> the superintendent of schools. I can certainly ask him to expedite uh, that paperwork to get to the, the families that would qualify. Sure. I think that's, I appreciate all of your efforts on this. With that, I close the- Can, can I ask, uh, you know, that brings up the point of when is the deadline? You know, uh, what is the, their opportunity, the, for people listening, what is the- July 1st. July 1st. Yeah, so we will get the applications out probably in sometime in February after the ordinances are finalized, mm -hmm. and then they'll have till July 1st to apply. Great, Great. thank you. Okay. Um, I'll look for a motion. Make a motion to direct the city attorney to prepare an ordinance amending section 23-72 of the code of ordinances of the city of Durango for the food and tax rebate program to be introduced at the January 16th, 2019 city council meeting. I'll second. Roll call, please. <coughs> Councilor White? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Music? Yes. Councilor Berkey? Yes. Mayor Marbury? Yes. Moving into 8.2.1, a public hearing to consider the El Rincon Preliminary Development Plan, which is 2605 Junction Street. So we'll begin with a staff presentation, please. Uh, Ms. Blake, did anyone sign up for public comment? Okay, thank you. Not on any of them. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of council. My name is Scott Shine, uh, Planning Manager for the City of Durango. I just wanted to take a minute uh, before Mark starts his presentation to just introduce these next three uh, public hearings. You'll notice that they're all residential developments in the city limits of Durango. They can all be considered uh, infill projects as well. And that's something that's encouraged in our housing plan that you adopted earlier this year. Um, infill projects, as many of you know, are also more difficult. Uh, solutions need to be customized to different sites. And so we've worked really hard, and, and Mark, especially in our office, has worked really hard um, to work with the applicants, work with the neighbors to come up with solutions for these next three projects. Um, two of them you've seen before. They've come before you a conceptual plan. Um, and since that time, we've been incorporating the direction given by Planning Commission and City Council into these preliminary plans, which in include all the detailed engineering and grading and drainage plans. Um, and those have been reviewed by, by our staff and other uh, agencies. So just to put that in context, if, if all of them go through, there will be 25 new 
units in the city of Durango, at least 25. Some could have ADUs. Um, so it may not sound like a lot, but it's, it's looking at ways to maximize land within the city and provide more housing options um, for residents. So uh, with that, Mark will do the detailed presentation. We'll also hand out um, hard copies of the staff report for you, for your, for your reference. It's not any new information, but if you want to take notes, if you want to see the specific language of the conditions, um, that's in the staff report for your reference as well. So we'll get you those um, and look forward to answering any questions you have. So thank you. Thank you. project you saw it first late last summer 2018 it's already last year now but to refresh your memory we're talking about this parcel of land uh, formerly owned by the Kreitz family it's across the street from Miller Middle School south of St. Paul's north of what will forever be called the Cowboy Church even though it's no longer the Cowboy Church this is a planned development and one of the requirements of a planned development is that <clears throat> the um, the developer has to provide some kind of information on the design. He doesn't have to design the buildings. Um, these are not the houses that are going to go into this development, but this is the theme that he wants to use. Uh, Mark Williamson, the developer, has a, prefers modern contemporary uh, architecture. And these were a couple of slides that he provided to give um, city council an indication of the type of house that will be seen on that property. There'll be 10 houses. We're doing a subdivision that includes 10 lots. That's reduced from the initial proposal earlier last year for 20, up to 22 units. And then when council saw this in late summer of 2018, you added a condition that they could also, each house could have an ADU if they meet the standards and go through the same process that any other house um, in EN4 would go through. So right now, um, we're in the preliminary. We approved the conceptual in September. The project meets the densities for the area for the comprehensive future land use map and for the zoning. And the project will have an interior road with on-street parking, tree lawn, and sidewalks. They'll also uh, improve Junction Street in front of the project between Miller School and this project. So. The sidewalks will get widened, and they'll make some on-street improvements, which I'll get into in a second. This is the actual plat. So this is the street. It's built to, even though it's going to be a private street, it's been built to city standards. The reason for that is at some point, and there's no plan for this to happen, but it potentially could happen someday, if St. Paul's Church were <clears throat> never to redevelop, then this could be a loop street, which is a preferred option. You know, if you have more ways in and out, it's always better than having one way, although this does meet um, the standards through the PD process. So we have 10 lots, single family homes. <clears throat> this is the portion that would loop through up to the St. Paul's access drive. And then it's a little hard to see here, but the tension for the site, it either flows or is piped to down here where it's treated and then uh, conveyed off-site and then down here in this corner the entrance into the cowboy church is this sort of splits it about half of that entrance is currently on the El Rincon property so the applicant will have to move that down a little bit and rebuild some of that entrance this is a three-step process conceptual was approved in September we're now in preliminary one of the major um, parts of this project has been the city working with 9R because it's such an important part of the character in that area. We've got uh, a big middle school right across the street from it with a lot of traffic, especially at pick up and drop off, but also at nights for special programs and assemblies and football games. So we really tried to work with the school and make it a point of emphasis to improve the situation out there if possible. So we're still gonna have on-street parking, but we're gonna add 
uh, a turn lane, which will allow more turning movements and people to get in the turn lane, uh, which should increase the flow and safety of the traffic. The applicant will be responsible for restriping the road in front of their project. And then in the longer um, run, we'll have a, I've got a couple of graphics for this, we'll have a longer turn lane. Uh, longer turn lane. This is the turn lane and the road section right in front of Rincon. So <clears throat> going from east on this side to west over here, we'll have on-street parking on the um, school side. And that was something that the school wanted to see because when kids get out of the cars, it's obviously safer when they step on the sidewalk than having to cross the street. So on-street parking, a travel lane right here. This is a turn lane, so they'll be stacking for people turning into the Cowboy Church into this project into St. Paul's. And then um, later on, when the next slide shows people coming from the north will have a turn lane to turn into Miller Middle School. We we'll also plan to relocate the crosswalk farther south, closer to the entrance of El Rincon. The reason for that is when the traffic comes out of here, if the crosswalk is here, um, these cars are going to stop before they come out, so it's a safer situation to have these crosswalks, just like a striped crosswalk downtown at an intersection. The closer you get it to the intersection, the safer it is. And uh, at some point, we need to identify funding for this. We have not identified funding um, yet. The school and the city would like to work together on this, but um, to have a pedestrian activated light up here currently the, there's a school crossing guard with a handheld stop sign, and maybe that'll stay. I don't know. That's up to the school, but um, that's also a safety improvement that we would like to see. This is the bigger picture turn lane. So these are the same improvements, just um, more of them. So in the meantime, just this will be striped by the applicant, and then there'll be short taper lanes. North and south, you just can't throw in a, all of a sudden there's a turn lane. So you have to have that, that taper. And in the future, when the city has some funding to do this, we'll extend this center turn lane all the way up almost to 28th Street on the north side and then down past, well, um, it'll end somewhere adjacent to the Cowboy Church. And that's based on the street widths. Um, we have the existing right of way to do all this. We will need a few extra feet of actual road surface in front of El Rincon to accommodate that new extra wide sidewalk. Right now it's three feet, which is not really very helpful. So it'll double the width of that. These are the big conditions of approval at the conceptual plan review. Um, there is just a, an idea that yes, you have to contribute to fair share housing because you're building four or more for sale units, the um, applicant opted to pay the fee in lieu. And based on our adopted uh, manual in fair share, that comes to $89,280 for their fee in lieu payment. The density is capped at 10 units. That does not include the ADUs. We don't include ADUs as, uh, as density. That has to do with the amount of people who are unrelated that can live on site is still capped at five. No vacation rentals will be allowed. There's a, so a soils and stability analysis for the slopes that are on the southwest side of the project. That's closer to the a bluff that drops off um, down towards Junction Creek. And our engineering staff has been reviewing that, and there are no issues. Um, as I mentioned, the applicant will be responsible for restriping Junction Street in front of the Rincon property. There's an offer to dedicate that right of way that I showed you in the subdivision plat. So if the city ever does need it, then we can have it. And then also to um, make sure the Cowboy Church entrance works. Because it's a plan development, the city and the applicant will sign a plan development agreement. All the major conditions of approval, um, the dimensional standards for the houses, this is in the EN4 neighborhood, so generally speaking, we'll have the same um, dimensional standards, height, uh, lot coverage, floor area ratio. There's actually not one in EN4, but um, we'll incorporate those into the plan development agreement. And at the final review, 
which we would like to do administratively, which is typical, will resolve any outstanding and minor issues. So the recommended action of staff is to approve the El Rincon preliminary plan with the conditions as listed in the staff report and direct the applicant to submit the final plan for staff review. And I'd be happy to answer any questions or go into more detail on the conditions of approval or... I have questions, but I need to uh, open and close the public testimony okay. first. So I, no one had signed up to participate or comment. So I'm opening and closing the public testimony. And now there are questions from the council. Is there a presentation of the developer? Um, he certainly can if he wants to. It's do you want, would you like to come up and say anything? You don't need to, <laughs> if you if you're uh, Sure. Uh, Mark Williamson, 177 Riverview Drive. Um, so we're increasingly excited about this project. You know, about 18 months ago, we started with 22 units, more of a multifamily concept and uh, with Lots of neighborhood participation. We kind of uh, changed our changed our direction, and now we're doing more of a kind of a pocket neighborhood, which we uh, are increasingly excited about, and we feel like it's you know more suited to the to the neighborhood, uh, especially with the encouragement uh, originally from Planning Commission to incorporate ADUs as much as possible. Um, I feel like we've been. Uh, very flexible with uh, 9R and working to try to uh, help with the, the traffic congestion at, you know, in the mornings and the evenings there by widening the road. Um, and what else? I, I think um, we've uh, worked with engineering to resolve the, some of the grading and uh, drainage challenges on the, on the site. And, seems like um, we're very close so I have a couple of questions if you could go back to the slide of the actual project I wanted to know where the snow removal will go and I also wanted to know where the garbage and recycling will go so De demonstrate that for us. yeah so all at city lots everyone's gonna have their own um, trash, trash con containers so they'll just move those to the to the front of, of, the the, street area. of the street area. And then we have, uh, you can't really tell, but this is a city street. So it's, we have parallel parking on, on those two sides of the street. So we anticipate having snow removal on the, on the, uh, on the two hammer, like in the ending area here and then up in there. And then with driveway, it's sort of, you know, a long way away from. And who will be responsible for the snow removal? The HOA of the subdivision. Okay. Yeah. Because that was some questions I had Correct. when I was reviewing the project. Any other questions? Well, it is a pub, the, it's a public street, though, the Al, Al Cali, the Rincon. Uh, no? It's a private street right. made, designed to city specifications. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's a, you know, it's, this is a, this is a property that's got some topo uh, challenges. Yeah. And, and I think they've been dealt with pretty well, but, uh, um, and I would applaud you also on, the, on you know, working with the, and the staff working with 9R because I've been working on Miller Middle School for a lot of years and that is a mess right out front. And I think that the, the striping solution uh, is, goes a long ways towards solving a lot of the congestion that happens there and moving that axe of the crosswalk toward what we all know now is the, the pickup spot. The Cowboy Church is the de facto pickup spot for nine, for uh, for uh, Miller Middle School kids uh, to get them closer. And and the last point is to widen that sidewalk from the crosswalk location to the Cowboy Church spot or you know, to get to that other side of the street for pickup. That, that current sidewalk situation is pretty untenable for, for uh, maintenance and safety of kids on the other side of the street. So uh, getting that improvement made and that crosswalk relocated I think is really key and completion of that striping plan. However, that needs to happen in the future, but uh, starting with in front of this property will do a lot. Um, I still think you got some topo challenges, you know, there's 11, 12 feet of topo drop 
for virtually every lot there. So it's not mm -hmm. going to be an easy uh, design effort, but you've thought about it a lot. Sure. And uh, we think that it will add to the architectural character of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. That's what you got to hope. Yeah, you got to hope for creativity. That's right. Thanks. Uh, Mayor Parton? Yeah. You had some of those backup lots on Florida Road, correct? To, to the mountain. Yep. The development is so maybe similar as that. Yeah. Just wondering. But a um, couple questions I had, and this might be to Amber, Mrs. Blake as well. Um, pedestrian lane, no pedestrian lane. We can't do that on that in front of Miller. A bike lane? Or yeah. A bike lane. Um, yeah. Can we talk? It, did, did that just we, get. Go ahead. It's just a whole process, right? That just got. Um, so we. The neighborhood had asked, it was in the multimodal master plan. Mm -hmm. the streets department overlaid the street and we implemented what was in the multimodal master plan. <coughs> At that point in time, we had notified the school and the school district yes. and hadn't received any comments against having a bike lane. And that's one of the reasons that we followed through with implementing the project out of the master plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. After the project was put into place, it had eliminated parking because there's not enough right of way with the sidewalk. So if you look at the existing street right of way, there was room for a bike lane in each direction and then a travel lane in each direction. But then that would make it so there was no parking lane. And so that um, was a large enough issue for the school district that they requested that those bike lanes be removed. Um, and like uh, Councillor Brookie mentioned a little earlier, um, with a change in how the use of the cow, the parking lot at the cowboy church um, that was being used as a big drop off location and parents parking there, but it's really not safe to have people parking in a bike lane. Mm -hmm. You, we can't have that. Um, I guess that the sidewalks are whitened in any case. And so, yeah, it's been. If I put my developer hat on. We agreed to widen Junction right. Street in front of our development, and we agreed to widen the sidewalk right. you know, in front of it as well. Which so, will help alleviate some of that. Uh, yeah, I think so. OK, good. OK, um, another question for you, uh, Marcus. Will the ADUs, if, if, they're, um, if the people want to build them, who contract with you, uh, be integrated into the building? Do you know? Well, I mean, that's a. My quick answer is yes, just based on the lot size. These are, you know, fairly small lots between six and eight thousand square feet. Um, so just based on what the, you know what you're left with with the building envelope and you know the given okay. setbacks, setbacks, I would think so. You know, above a garage, you know that that type of thing. So. But that will depend if, if the builder wants to do that with you. That's correct. Yeah. I mean, we're trying to market it as a, you know, as, as, a, as a benefit, you know, as a potential passive revenue stream for yeah. people. So, and, uh, and we just, um, right before the new year, sort of um, kind of put the word out there for the first time. So we've, you know, we've, we've had uh, some success and in in interest in the, in the okay. interviews. So. And then one other question, and Ms. Blake, this might be to you again. Could the pedestrian lane be funded from the multimodal projects 2015? At the intersection yeah. of is that on the 25th, list? it is on the list. It is on the um, list. We currently have a Safe Routes to School project that includes that rapid flashing beacon, um, and we're working through CDOT, so that means it takes a lot longer and right. just installing it um, but it could be funded through the multimodal programs we are having some issues with that location right now so it's kind of in a standstill with some concerns that cdot has okay. and some constraints with the grant funding um, related to um, okay paperwork so it's on the done. list that there's yeah. but it's caught up i'm just thinking the safety of those kids yeah. okay that's here's a question well, I'm really glad to see the ADUs are there personally because <coughs> for the ADU program in Durango, it gives grandparents probably a chance to live closer to their kids, let's say, or to uh, have a benefit of some additional uh, income for the mortgage uh, payment. So I'm, ha I'm always happy to see that. I live in a neighborhood where there are ADUs. 
and I live right next door to a, a house with an ADU, and I have wonderful neighbors. So I support Phil, and I certainly support the ADU program that we currently have. I know in different parts of town, uh, a grandmother that lives on the property with, their, with her family. So this is a wonderful benefit in our community. And Durango is quite the leader across the United States in the ADU program as well because of our guidelines, which says owner occupied. And uh, that's a great benefit. That shows pride of ownership. So with that, I will ask for a motion from council, please. I'd like to make a motion to approve the Alcorn Rincon preliminary plan and direct the applicant to submit the final plan for review. To okay. staff. And I, th I think we, uh, Mark, could you get those, the, the recommended language because there were two pieces missing. For condition, conditions? Uh, the one is the, including the conditions and, and mm -hmm. also the uh, staff review. The normal conditions. Yeah. yeah. All right, I'll second that. Unless we we're going to include these conditions okay. in that motion. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'll revise that motion to say approve the Algorithm Con preliminary plat and direct the applicant to submit the final plan for review to staff uh, and direct uh, uh, with the conditions as listed in the staff report. That works. I'll second. Period. Yeah, Roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem Yusuf? Yes. Councillor Brickey? Yes. Councillor White? Yes. Mayor Marbury? Yes. Moving into 8.2.2, a public hearing to consider the Sunye Preliminary Development Plan, which is 821 <coughs> East 32nd Street. And a staff report, please. Thank you, Mark Williams again, uh, still from Community Development. This is the Sunye Preliminary Plan. You saw this. Thank you. Originally, in August, the month before, we saw Rincon. Uh, to refresh your memory, we're talking about a lot which was originally one acre just on the west side of Sunshine Gardens, and I'm sorry, east of Sunshine Gardens and west of TL Roofing. Um, since you originally saw it, the applicants have also gone through a boundary adjustment process with the county and they've added about four tenths of an acre to the lot and almost all of that four tenths of an acre uh, was used for this street and uh, retaining wall right here. So this is a site plan to give you an indication of what it is we're looking at. This has been revised since council saw this uh, last year. And the way it's different is originally, we still had the private drive on this side, which is uh, the east side, north on this map is off to the right. And the lot was to be divided into traditional um, subdivision style, single family homes with driveways and then uh, backyards back here. And in the initial negotiations between city and uh, the applicant, Paul Sunier, um, Mr. Sunier wanted to have two or three vacation rentals and six or seven um, housing units, and we eventually ended up with 12 housing units in six duplexes and one vacation rental. But the big change it really is the addition of the alley on the west side of the lot and bringing the houses closer to the front setback. So Mr. Sunier hired a local architect, Steve Gates, as you can see, um, to give this a more contemporary feel. So these um, houses are rear uh, alley loaded. These are uh, the cars that come in the garage through the backs of the lots. And then each one of these houses has a front porch. And the intent of that is to create more of a community neighborhood feel and get people closer to their neighborhoods. And that's proved to be a pretty popular um, design idea in places like Three Springs. Uh, this is not exactly like Three Springs, but same general idea. So the alley also allows city trash vehicles to complete this loop. Originally, um, there was just a street with a turnaround right here. So that's a more efficient movement for city operations. 
We still have this as a private drive, but it's built as a Rincon to city standards. And that's because to the north of here, there are several lots which are not developed, but one day they may be developed with single family houses. And at that point, um, this will need to become a public street because you need to have a public street to access other people's properties, which is why this is being developed to a, a city standard. And as with Rincon, there's a, there'll be an offer to dedicate the right of way um, if we ever need to see that. So also a contemporary design. These are the images that um, Mr. Sunier and Mr. Gates provided us as to the general idea of what it is they're going to design. So squared off um, units with big windows, front porches, um, definitely contemporary. As I stated earlier, you saw this in August. The density was approved at a maximum of 12 units uh, with the new alley, which is not what you saw earlier, but um, we think it's a better design and the staff supports that design. One of the things that we had to take into consideration was <clears throat> this site plus the teal roofing site and the Sunshine Garden site has an interesting history in terms of, I mean, going way back originally, it was a moraine from 10,000 years ago, the end of the last ice age. And then over the years, it was mined for gravel, and then it was filled in certain places. And so the, the elevations of these three lots have changed considerably. And our land use code does require us to have something called a reference elevation. That's the, the original grade. Um, you know, what is the original grade? Because that's where you measure how tall your houses can be from. It's hard to really figure out what the reference elevation is here. So at that point, um, we thought the most important way to measure it was what's the impact to the neighbors because as you can see from the, the vicinity map, they are pretty close to the neighbors on the east side of Sunshine Gardens. Well, our code allows a duplex to be 30 feet when it's new. Um, if you build a duplex, you're entitled to build it 30 feet high. We looked at the uh, fill elevations and thought that 24 feet would be pretty appropriate. Um, that approximates as best as we can tell what the level of fill here was. And this sits up, the west side sits up a little bit above these homes. So um, lowering that overall height reduces the impact to these houses. And so we thought that was um, a good compromise. We're in the second step of the plan development process. This project complies with the future land use density and zoning standards. And um, so what we, what we would be doing is approving the, um, the annexation and subdivision, and then we'd do a final review. Um, and at the point where the uh, whoever builds the houses wants to build them, they would need to do an as-built plat, which is a process we use for townhomes. So in other words, we create these six lots. Um, the uh, applicant can either choose to build on them or sell the property. A new builder comes in. They have to do at least the footprint, which we review to make sure that it meets our setbacks and um, is appropriately built. And then they can um, build up the units after the city approves it at that point. As with Rincon, it's a plan development, so we'll need to do a plan development agreement. It's also an annexation, so we always roll those two into one document, and that'll be done at the final um, review process, and that will incorporate all the conditions of approval. This is the subdivision plat that shows the six lots, and the alley that goes through here. These are the detention areas um, on this corner and then up in this area. The lot is big enough that the water has to be treated on site and cleaned and then it's piped off site. This is the road and this is the retaining wall. Uh, um, one thing that I, I'm thinking of your question for the last project is that trash collection is 
going to be on the street. Um, so the, each property owner will take the garbage can to the street for the and recycling for the trash trucks to pick up, just as they would on a. Go back to your slide, which where shows sunshine uh, and. Um, okay, now show me where the trash is going to be picked up there. So the trash will be picked up um, on the east side of the lot. <coughs> so if you remember, the alley goes through here. We'll have people haul their trash out to the east side. Okay. And the front porches will face. Um, to the right, to towards TL roofing. To, to TL roofing. Okay. Yeah, that way. Okay, I can see that better. And where where does then units one and two? Where does the, where do they bring their trash? So they'll also <coughs> there's space to for everyone to bring their their trash out to to this side. And eleven and twelve will also. They may have to have a little bit of a longer walk. And is that up? And then which side of the street do they, I mean, is it, is it just on the, uh, just well, the west side of the street? I mean, it could be on either side of the street, and it's really how Levi wants it. I think but we can't hear you, so. Scott Shine, planning manager, just a quick consultation with Levi, and the turning radiuses can be made so that they can pick up in the alley like they would in downtown, oh. so that they wouldn't be hauled out to the street there wouldn't be conflicts with on street parking so that's, that's, okay. i think really the good. applicant and uh, staff and operations would prefer that design it okay. makes Sorry. a lot more sense yeah because i i was wondering about uh, I, I think when i read the documentation initially i thought you were talking about having the trash picked up on the east side of the street which then asked well where's the snow re where's the snow removal going to go and and I think the using the alley pickup solves solves that. Yeah, as you can see, the the iterate there've been a couple of iterations originally. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a centralized trash pickup area, and obviously, if you live over here, um, just hauling your can out to the curb is a better solution. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry that I wasn't clear. Mark, I might be missing something. Uh, in our package, I'm not seeing the submittal package includes plans, building footprints, infrastructure improvements in the amenity area. The site plan contains detailed engineering drawings for water sewer lines as well as retaining walls. So you, you flashed on a, doc, uh, a sheet that we didn't have in our packet, uh, uh, which was this one? the lot layout, the, the, that plat. Uh, and it seems to be a little out of whack with the in relation to the fire truck turnaround radiuses and some of those things on that uh, northerly most access to the alley right there. Um, that doesn't really jive with what is represented in the site plan for fire truck turnaround. Are you talking about this one? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that's a much bigger radius and looks to be appropriate, whereas I don't see that in the... You're right. Are you talking? Are you talking about this radius right here? Yeah, yeah. And what, what if that? You know, <coughs> what what that actually is on that sketch versus that engineering drawing doesn't really. Yeah, well, find the radius, but that doesn't. We'll make sure that that radius is adequate for both um, garbage recycling and for DFPD. Yeah, it's, it's a big radius. It's what Steve showed on the on the site plan, I believe, rather than what's shown on that engineering drawing. And it, you talk about uh, water lines, sewer lines, as well as retaining walls. Uh, what, where on this uh, property is, or would be there a requirement for retaining walls? We don't see any topo here, so I guess is the point. Right. Um, it's pretty loose. Go back to the aerial. This was not mined as much as this, so there's a great change on this side of the property. Um, so the retaining wall is on that used to be. Yeah, sorry to keep jumping around between slides, but you've got the sidewalk, tree lawn, the road, and then another tree lawn. There's no sidewalk. And then this area has to be retained. So that'll be part of the retaining wall for um, the edge of the TL roofing site, which is it's higher than this site. So yeah. there are uh, retaining wall structural drawings in the 
in the complete site plan set, I didn't include all got the it. structural yeah. stuff. So what you got? So how high is that wall, for example? Do we, uh, that's a big structure. It's, it's looking at Steve, eight, eight, eight feet. That's what I thought, yeah, eight feet. Would you go back to your green slide? I have a question. No, the, the other one shows a gate. And so the gate is at the top of the property. And that Up here. blocks. I saw a gate on a drawing. So that gate uh -huh. blocks anyone from going onto that other road? Yeah, these are all private lots right now. Um, actually, the applicant owns several of these. Uh, yes. he, these two he does not own. But there is a gate right now and um, there's a we actually need to relocate uh, either the gate or a fire hydrant that's up here to make sure that DFPD has access to it in this upper northeast corner but um, I'm not sure what your question is. Well, the question is, is the gate locked, closed? Is it it's usually locked. Okay. So that the residents won't be going into other people's private property back there? Well, um, they won't be able to drive, but you know, if they, they wanted to walk, I guess it would be hard to stop them. Okay. And t and L Roofing, uh, they're not in the city, are they? They are not. So, the Sunshine is. Correct. So, t and L could choose to come in in some future. Yes. Maybe, who knows why, okay. All right, thank you for that information. Uh, there was no one signed up for public testimony. I opened it, I closed it. Are there any questions from, more questions? It's one last question about access along this private drive to those properties. Um, that came up once before in terms of uh, any restrictions to this prop property relative to accessing. I mean, how, how much access can go beyond? I mean, that can't be a future. Well, city street. So, is there limitations posed? Right now, it's just a it's a private street serving this lot. So these owners don't have rights to access offsite because that this is private property. So that's why the gate is there. If um, one of these lots does develop, we'll have we'll call in that offer to dedicate, make this a public street, then extend. Um, the access up to a certain point on here to get the people to wherever it is they need to go, whether it's this lot or this lot or Isn't this that lot. the Simmons property back there? I think this is Mr. Simmons. Um, Frank Sitton owns this property, I think. <coughs> is that right? Yeah. But I guess, I guess is, is it the, will it be written in the covenants for these 12 units? that they have the opportunity to say yay, yes or no relative to future access through their development to those. I see, I see. So right currently, if someone wants to, if this person wants to get to their lot, well, currently they they have access through Riverbend Drive to right. get through no here. Road. Right, okay. and it's not, Riverbend is really substandard. It's really narrow, right. I don't know how narrow. Yeah. And probably not a good idea to try to make that um, a through street. So we would prefer to have this as the primary access. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, um, these property owners can get through from the west. I, I would totally agree, except this is a private drive, dedicated as a private drive, this, not a public street, and it can't be this one. made into a public street section, because uh -huh. it's so a private you, street what section. Are you, what are you thinking? That it should well, be. I'm saying, I, I want to know what's going to happen. Is this going to become a street to serve a much broader, bigger? Uh, well, well, there are uh, another 15, 20. The intent minutes. is for it to become a public street. However, these lots all have restrictive covenants. They're dedicated as um, mostly open space. So there are covenants on all, all of these that limit each house to one single family home. And I think they're, and Paul Sonier will correct me if I'm wrong. So there's one, two, three, and I think there are two more east of here. So it, it could be a total of five houses. Yeah. So it's limited. It, yeah. And all I'm saying is that should be probably described in the in okay. CCNRs for, for the bylaws of the Homeowners Association of this property, this project. Well, are we blocking future development then uh, with this private drive? My intent would not be, but. Uh, I think it has limitations, and this, it was, you know, we don't want to 
is this going to become a public street in the future? If so, it ought to be designed as a public street. Um, isn't it? I think that it's, it's a private but, but I think, but, uh, but in an, um, by analogy to the El Rincon project that we just talked about, uh, where there was an explicit ded dedication to possible future access to the neighboring lot, mm -hmm. um, it strikes me that that ought to be a condition on this. I would, I would hate to think that this city council is setting up a roadblock for something that might happen five or ten years down the future. You see what I'm, that's where I'm I... I'm not saying this city council, I'm saying this design is not of a standard that can support infinite amount of new development beyond. It's a private drive. It's a, it's a skinnier street. It is, it is right? a little bit skinnier, but it's still a, a standard that complies with reduced street section in the LEDC. Right. So we ran it through engineering and um, they're okay with it. But um, you're right, it's not- so We're saying the city of Durango at some point in the future would, would accept this as a, as a public street if future demand. Right. How much thinner is it? Um, it doesn't have a sidewalk on this side and it doesn't have parking on street parking here. Mm -hmm. So it's probably about 13 feet, 12 feet less from right of way to right of way. That includes like the back of the sidewalk to the. To it's a lot. It's, <laughs> it's a big difference, but, but it's, mm -hmm. it's you know, I think. And they did that in order to put the alley, evidently. That's what makes this right. property work. Right. For sure. That's why I said it's just not going to become Delwood or you know, right. City Street. Right. If that's what the expectation is. Well, are you proposing then that uh, there should be another document, another step, that if that property, the property in back of it, go to the, the green slide, please, at some point? I would hate to say to the people that own that lot, well, you know, we. We did an injustice to them in the future. They couldn't access it or develop it. So well, clearly with the gate, they're anticipating access. It's just a matter of how many units can be, will that provide access to? It's not going to be the right the future access to North Durango. It's I five got lots, it. as, as Mark represented. Right. So should we, should we include in the documentation then that just like in Rincon, that that be dedicated for a future right-of-way or something? Right. to open up that back section. Right, well, we intend to do that. Oh, you will, we okay. Just... So that, that way, whoever owns that property in the future, and they, if they choose to ever develop it, they have a way to get out to 32nd. If River Bend will never make it. Right, because River Bend is so narrow, we needed plan B, and this is plan right. B. Okay, as long as that's in there, I think we're okay, Dean. And I would assume, then, if those properties do develop, then, um, you know, uh, staff may have, say, there are conditions because of that road that you can't produce, you know, you can't develop 50 units up there because it can't handle that traffic. Right, and my understanding is the, the restrictive covenants that are on here are pretty ironclad, and it's only one house per lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, no, I'm, I'm talking about the, you know, the point that, that, uh, that Dean has raised is, that's an, a relatively narrow street mm -hmm. and it's uh, we're envisioning that it may in the future provide access to properties to the north mm -hmm. and the question is how many units could be built there without overloading that road but it strikes me that's an engineering constraint that would be imposed on any future development and the question is is that supposition correct um, <clears throat> well, so in the LUDC, we have street standards broken up by residential, industrial, arterial, etc. We also have um, reduced standards, which are also acceptable under certain conditions. The width of this property is such that um, a full 60-foot residential right-of-way um, wasn't really feasible. So I said 12 or 13 feet. Earlier, I think it's a little bit, the difference isn't that big, it's more like 10 or 11 feet. So it, it does have two travel lanes, full-size okay. travel lanes and a full-size parking lane. 
and a tree lawn swale and a sidewalk. Mm -hmm. So it's really the on street parking on the east side, and then there's no sidewalk on the east side either. That's where we lose that, mm -hmm. that width. So in terms of the traffic volume, that shouldn't be affected. Okay. I, I just didn't want someone to say, oh, that no, city sorry. council in 2019, Good you know, didn't uh, cause me more problems in 2025 or whatever. So as long as that documentation's in there to allow yeah, for development. Make sure it's in there. Or possible development. Okay. Then I, I don't want anybody to be mad at this council five, ten years from now. Uh, all right. Well, with that, uh, no more questions. I've closed the public testimony. I will look for a motion from City Council. I would uh, move that, um, <clears throat> let's see, I've lost, I've lost the uh, documentation. Mark, do you have uh, a f suggested phrasing of our motion? That it would Why include the conditions my of approval and, oh, and staff review. We got sidebarred. Um, can I finish my presentation? Oh, I'm just sorry. Few things. I went through. Um, so these were the conceptual plan conditions, uh, which is that preliminary plan where we are now. We'd have yep. more detailed uh, engineering plans, utility plans, retaining, which we do, and some design intent. One vacation rental is permitted. We'll make sure it's on one of the ends, uh, end units, not in the middle unit to Good. reduce the impact. Um, there are also subject to fair share because they are for sale units and to answer your question councillor marbury we'll have a plat note to offer to dedicate the access drive to the city is right away if needed to access lots to the north okay. for development okay. and then um, some of the current conditions of approval limited to 12 units one vacation rental mr sunier is also opting to pay in the fee in lieu which is one hundred and seven thousand mm -hmm. dollars as i discussed earlier the maximum height for these uh, structures, which will have flat roofs, is 24 feet. And then we'll clarify how the trash gets picked up in the ADUs and vacation rental as well in the covenants. Okay, there's no ADU. I'm sorry. That's okay. Vacation rental. Vacation rental. All right. Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, so our recommended action is to approve the preliminary plan with the conditions as listed and direct the applicant to submit the final plan for you. Now, I will ask for a motion. I'm hesitating because um, I, I think it's appropriate to add the condition that the um, development dedicate, um, a, yeah, offer, offer for dedication to the city of the uh, offer the offer this. Help me with the language. The right uh, of offer the right of way to the to the city, uh, subject to potential development to the north. In, I mean, which is exactly which was what the conditions were for the uh, El Rincon property, and I don't believe I saw them in. The wasn't it? Wasn't it in that last slide? Yeah. Can I see what you're, uh, so oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's there. It is there. It, it, yeah. It is there. Sorry. Mark there on his last slide. Okay. Go back. Go back In that case, I will simply make the motion, approve the Sunye preliminary plan with conditions as listed in the staff report, and direct the applicant to submit final plan for staff review. Second. I'll second. Roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem Yusuf? Yes. Councilor White? Yes. Councilor Bricky? Yes. Mayor Marbury? Yes. Happy to see this all go forward. Looking forward forward to seeing that development. Thank you so much. Uh, we're moving into 10.1, which is an ordinance amending Chapter 2, Article 6 of the Code. Of, no, oh, we still have one more. more. Oh, there's one more? Oh, oh there we go. <coughs> Trifecta. Uh, that's right, Tunier, 8.2.3. A public hearing to consider the review and approval of the 2706 Junction Street Minor Preliminary Subdivision and 28th Street Right-of-Way Abandonment. We are moving and a grooving. Thank you. Okay. So this is a relatively straightforward subdivision. It's a minor subdivision because there are fewer than six lots that will be created through this. Mm -hmm. This is the property. It's at the corner of 28th Street mm -hmm. and Junction Street. So we're just up the street from El Rincon. This is Miller Middle School and this is the 
where everybody drives in and out of Miller Middle School. Um, while we're on this, um, this slide, I think I'll go through some of the, the information that, that's on here, because I think a lot of it can be conveyed just from looking at this when it, in terms of the issues. So one of the issues is they also, the applicant, Tracy Reynolds, wants to have a right-of-way abandonment of West 28th Street all the way down. Um, right now, this right-of-way is 80 feet wide. The city standard is 60 feet. It's a little bit less than 80 feet, and the city standard is 60 feet. So um, after the abandonment, if it's approved, this street right-of-way would still meet the city standard for a residential uh, right-of-way width. And then um, there'll also be a tree lawn, street trees, and sidewalks will be installed as part of this in that right of way. And um, the abandonment, the reason for that is it increases the size of this lot to a big enough size that this can be subdivided into three lots. Without the abandonment, this could only be subdivided into two lots. The city is okay with giving up that portion of the right of way because we don't ever anticipate that this will be a through street. As you can see, this trail curves, and there's a reason for that. That's really steep. It's too steep for this to ever meet the city's um, road grade standard. Plus, it's on the Miller School property, and um, they might not like us trying to drive through the property. <coughs> this is an alley. It's platted as an alley. It's been there for decades and decades and decades. It doesn't really function as an alley. However, it, it's sort of become adopted as um, open space for the neighbors, and so we had to be um, cognizant of that as we were reviewing this project because this neighborhood uh, to the north and to the northeast is big enough that any more development requires an emergency access, and this is the only place that emergency access could go. I mean, this is Animus Mountain up here. This is really, really, this is even steeper than this, and that's too steep to build a road through. So we tried to find a happy medium between meeting our code, which says you have this many units, you need to provide emergency access, and um, dealing with the residents who live right next door to the alley, who have, you know, they have sort of adopted that as part of their yard. This is on 28th Street, looking west. This is the end of that alley. As you can see, it's not improved. It's just a double track. And it goes <clears throat> past this lot to the neighbor's lot and then ends at the fence in the Miller Middle School parking lot. So the applicant will um, they'll have to remove this house and that house in order to build the houses, which will look like this. Um, the houses may not look exactly like this, but you get the idea. They're a little bit more contemporary than some of the houses around, which makes sense because they're just being built now. But they also look, um, they're not that different from Artisan Court, which is an infill project mm -hmm. right up the street. Right. Um, roughly the same size lots, roughly the same size houses. So some of the review details, it complies with the comp plan density. If the abandonment is granted and the zoning standards, it's zone E and 4. There'd be three lots. As I mentioned earlier, street trees, curb and gutter, and sidewalk on 28th Street. <clears throat> also, street trees along the junction will have to be installed. The lots range from about 8,000 to more than 10,000 square feet. We'll have emergency access. And that compromise that I referenced earlier between the city standards and the neighbors is. We could have um, required the street to be paved all the way from 28th to, to the emergency, or to the existing fence. There's another complication in that this is a really flat area, so drainage is not very good. The more impervious surface you add, the worse the drainage gets. So what we propose is to have 16 feet of uh, graving and gravel, and that's something that Durango Fire Protection District will accept. They'll accept 16 feet plus another two foot clear zone on each side of that. So a total of 20 feet with 16 feet um, being gravel. In reality, the only reason that we would ever have to use this is if there was an emergency and a bus or a truck or something blocked the entrance to 28th and Junction and 
this is the only way out, and hopefully that'll never happen. This is the, um, these are the dimensions of that abandonment that I'm talking about, which is this section right here. Um, it scoots in a little bit right here because this house was built in the right of way. And so about 10 years ago, the city did uh, another adjustment right here to get that house out of our right of way. Hmm. This is a subdivision plan, pretty straightforward. The drainage that I talked about <clears throat> will have the, uh, the applicant, when he designates and builds these three lots, to have water flow from the alley this way. And there'll be some infiltration in here, uh, a little swale with, to absorb some of that water. And if it floods, then the flood water will be directed out over the sidewalk into the gutter on Junction Street. These are the site plans for the houses, the floor plans. Um, I think we are, yeah. The driveway for that house is on the east side. One of the concerns that the neighbors on the east side of the alley, and not just them, but also uh, in the rest of the neighborhood, had was, as you know, Miller Middle School is a pretty crazy place during pickup and drop off hours. And right now, there's a solid fence along the Miller School parking lot. If we have a gate that's a typical fire access gate where you just got a swing arm and that's it then the kids could walk through or around that gate or under it into the neighborhood and then their parents could drive in on 28th Street, increasing congestion and the neighbors were concerned about that. So what we asked the applicant to do was, this is still a functional gate, but it's just built with fence panels and that makes it look like it does now and keeps the same situation where um, pick up and drop off is on the Miller School lot. We'll also have a, a posted no parking emergency access sign right here. And the city and the school district have been working together on this project as well. And that's to make sure we have an emergency access easement and there's a draft of that, so we don't anticipate that being a problem. Um, one of the other issues is this house uh, has its water from this, uh, from 28th Street, and it actually goes into the neighbor's lot and through their lot, and we don't think that's a good situation to have their entire water line go through someone's house you know, 20 years from now. If that water line breaks, then <clears throat> city crews or some crew would have to go into um, the yards of two property owners who had no idea this could happen. So we don't want that to happen. We're gonna have access for water come off either Junction Street or from the Miller School parking lot. There are two water lines that are really close to that property line and the applicants have agreed to that. So the abandonment, um, that right of way abandonment will make sure that everyone has legal access. The lots are contoured, as I mentioned, to drain out to the street instead of ponding in the middle of that big flat area. The alley is designed, intended to provide emergency access, minimize impact to neighborhood to extend possible, that's the neighbor who lives next door, and to prevent cut through traffic. And if you recall from the site plan earlier, there, I'll go back to it. So we're adding three houses. There's also, there's a curb cut right here, right now, for the existing house. This house will use a curb cut, so we're only adding one curb cut, which is, in terms of traffic safety, is, is good. The fewer curb cuts you have, the less um, potential conflicts for pedestrians and cars. So some of the big conditions of approval are that the applicant will install all those standard improvements. The water service will come off junction or from Miller to this house. Uh, there are a few big trees on this property, and because it's a three-lot subdivision, the city is going to require <coughs> Mr. Reynolds to come up with a tree replacement plan that we'll look at in the next step in the final review. The city arborist will review that as well to make sure that it meets all of our standards. And you know, basically, there's a formula. If you cut down a tree that's X size, you have to replace it with X amount of trees. 
So I discussed the emergency access gate, which is okay with the fire protection district. The access has been on Miller's property, drainage. And so this uh, action, actually there's two actions for this project. The first action is the abandonment. So if the council does not approve the abandonment, there's no reason to go to the subdivision because the subdivision couldn't happen. This is staged to have the abandonment uh, voted on first. If that's approved, then um, council should vote on the minor subdivision, and we recommend that with the conditions as listed. And uh, as typical with a minor subdivision, you would direct the applicant to um, do the final plan and mile ours for the mayor's signature. Thank you very much. I don't think there was anyone that signed up for public testimony. Would anyone like to comment? Seeing none, I'll close the public testimony and ask for questions by city council. <coughs> Any uh, questions over here? He's choking to death. Um, uh, so take it, take it slow and easy. The council. whole premise of the abandonment is um, that it has to happen to make this work. Yes. I mean, how? I mean, these lots are 10,000, 8,300, 8, 8,100 square feet. The city lot is, the potential city lot is significantly smaller than that. So I just question the need for the abandonment to actually, to make a failure statement that says it couldn't happen without, these yeah, lots could uh, be created without <clears throat> the abandonment. It's funny you say that because we originally had the same thought process and we went through, um, going through with a four lot subdivision originally in the abandonment and ultimately determined that that was too dense and that we needed, we needed the abandonment for even just for three. And that's because in our LUDC, in the EN4B zone district, um, the average, the way we interpret our code is the average of those lots that are created needs to be eight and a half thousand square feet. Okay. That's the reason for the abandonment. Um, well, that stated, then thought comes to me: we we do abandonments of city right of ways a lot. Mm -hmm. East Fourth Avenue comes to mind, where uh, that it ends in a cul-de-sac, and there was a it's it's a developed neighborhood, and those people were just asking for their front yards to be extended. Essentially, in this case. It is achieving a new subdivision for the profit and benefit of a developer. And at what point does the city say that's an asset that should be marketed? You know, we should be compensated for that release of uh, city property. You know, you know, if it could, if it stated that the only way this could happen, these three lots are to be created for profit and sale, uh, is by city release of an asset. So I'm just raising that question amongst our counselors to understand why we, you know, because there is no compensation involved in this except but for the improvements that they are going to make to this right of way, this, to what was the old right of way. They're putting in improvements like any other developer would on any other street. They're putting in <coughs> sidewalks and trees and all that kind of stuff. But in fact, we're giving them free land. I just put that out there. Yeah, I will, I will chime in. There's a statute on abandonment of rights of way. So the dedication of a right of way, I think is a little bit different than acquisition of another piece of property and fee. So the statute does dictate that if you, and, and this would attach to this property because you're only, you're only abandoning a portion of the right of way. There's actually a statute that says that automatically, if you, if you find that one of the findings that you have to make as part of that abandonment process is that you no longer need the property for right of way. So again, I think what I would say is that I think, you know, I've never looked into the idea of uh, asking for compensation for an abandonment, but typically those are done because those are dedicated to the city at some point for a particular purpose, for piece of a road. Mm -hmm. And so once that use is no longer needed, I mean, you're under, you're under no obligation to abandon it, obviously, but if you do, if you do determine that you don't need it anymore, then there's an automatic process. So I would distinguish this kind of ownership from a piece of property that you would own in fee other than a dedication of a right of way. Good, good. That makes sense. That's, that's good clarification. And supported also by the fact that previous abandonments down that same street have been provided by the city. Uh, you should be you, you documented where there was another 
that that particular right of way has already been abandoned. Go back to your slide, that show, please, sir. That shows the uh, the where it needs to be abandoned. The uh, proposed abandonment area is this. This is between 16 and 17 feet. Um, all the way, just to make that uniform, although um, the project area ends right there. So it's this frontage. Are and there other houses that would benefit from this abandonment? There are two houses. Uh, there one, two? Yeah, they've already cleared up. So there are two houses right here. Their lots would become a little bit bigger. So it will benefit the neighbors. Um, yeah. Yes. Free land. Yes. yes, yes, is the answer. The neighbors okay. will, yes. will have some. Okay. <laughs> See? Uh, and 28th Street serves a much larger, it serves the whole hillside there as well. Right. So um, that right of way, I mean, it's maximum built out has been achieved, but for these three yeah. mm -hmm. lots. I mean, what other lots along there could go, could be similarly subdivided and thus create an increase in density? That There's some big lots up, it's off the, well, let me see if the aerial has it. I mean, up the hill. Yeah, it doesn't really go far enough. There's some big lots up here. Yeah, there. Um, I don't know if they could be subdivided or not. It kind of depends on their lot frontage and right. some other things. But there's some undeveloped lots on Carroll Drive farther up. Okay. Well, from that standpoint, and given the uh, city attorney's uh, response to that question, I feel comfortable in being fiduciary res responsible for vacating this uh, right way. And I think the other neighbors, those other houses will, will have enjoy some benefit of the abandonment as well. And so I'm, I'm perfectly okay with that. Mm -hmm. It strikes well, me they already have, they de facto, they have it already. But, right, but now but this would be official. legal. Yeah. Mm -hmm officially here. And um, I know that property very well. It's a, a lovely piece of property. Um, everyone knows who it belongs to, I'm sure, and it's passed on. But um, so you're saying our code, he can only build three single family residences, even though those lots are enormous? Right, because of the, <clears throat> because of the zone district that it's in. If this size lot was on the grid, they could do more. but. Um, hmm. It's not a stance. Is there a potential for accessory dwelling units on this big old lot? Yeah, each house could have the option should of having an ADU. As long as they can. I know we're not going to see it right now, but it, my brain says, why not? You know, with that, size, up, yeah. with that size of a lot. So, um, okay. Um, any other questions? I think we're there. So I will ask for uh, a motion from City Council. I would ask we do two motions. One oh, for the yes, sir. That's All right. I'll make a motion to approve the 28th Street right of way abandonment and direct the city attorney to prepare the abandonment ordinance for adoption at the next regularly scheduled city council meeting. Second. I'll second. And a roll call, please. Councillor White? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Musa? Yes. Councillor Ricky? No. And Mayor Marbury. Yes. Okay. Uh, moving into motion two. Uh, yes, ma'am. Approve the 2706 Jun Junction Street subdivision preliminary plan review and direct the applicant to prepare the final plan and mylars and authorize the mayor to sign the final plan mylars once all necessary revisions are made. Is there a second? I'll second. Roll call, please. Councillor White? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Yusuf? Yes. Councillor Brookie? Yes. Mayor Marbury? Yes. Now we're moving into city ordinances. 10.1 uh, is an ordinance amending Chapter 2, Article 6 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Durango regarding the application of the Colorado Campaign Fair Practices Act to municipal elections and declaring an effective date. Uh, Mr. Nelson? Yes, this is ordinance uh, 0-2019-1, the first one of the year. 
Yeah. Um, in mm. addition, is the follow up to council direction to make amendments regarding campaign finance practices in the city. Thank you so much. I will look for a motion. I'll move we approve ordinance 0 2019 1. I'll second. Roll call, please. Councilor Yusuf? Yes. Councilor White? Yes. Councilor Bricky? Yes. Mayor Marbury? Yes, and I'm very, see, very happy to see this enacted in the city of Durango. Ordinance number 10.2, an ordinance amending certain sections of chapter 25 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Durango regarding definitions, discharge regulations, and requirements for food service establishments to implement a fats, oil, and grease inspection program. Uh, Mr. Nelson? Yeah, this is Ordinance 2019-2, and this follows uh, a long uh, effort on step by staff to uh, put together a that's all the geese in Greece program to protect the uh, sewer system and the sewer treatment plant. I will look for a motion. Make more motion to approve ordinance number 0219-2. Second. I'll second. A roll call, please. Councilor White? Yes. Mayor Pro Tim Musa? Yes. Councilor Bricky? Yes. Mayor Marbury? Yes. We are moving into council reports and actions. And so I will look to my uh, counselors. Uh, Mayor Pro Tim? Uh, I would just like to say Happy New Year and thank you to everyone who is tuning in tonight on this last week of our holiday season. Um, it's been a great holiday season. I hope everybody got to get out and enjoy some of that wonderful snow and uh, it was fabulous to see uh, Buckley Park so crowded with snow <laughs> sledders and purgatory so busy. It was just a wonderful week. So I hope everyone enjoyed it. And I also just wanted to say I'm looking, two more things. I'm really looking forward to 2019. I'm looking forward to a collaborative, productive, and, um, and just constructive year together. We have a big year ahead of us. We have uh, our mayor, Marbury, and our former mayor, White, who are concluding, getting ready to conclude their eighth year of service with the city of Durango. This is just an unbelievable thing to me as I enter my second year of service. Their, their time and energy and effort that they have dedicated to the city is tremendous. And so I look forward to working with them as they conclude their um, terms on council. And then I really look forward to uh, welcoming two new counselors um, in April to our uh, city council and assimilating them um, into our program and, and, and getting them familiar with their new roles. So we have a lot to look forward to. I did also want to just suggest that um, I really appreciated everyone's dialogue today about the Parks and Recreation um, and the difficult decisions that we have to discuss next week. Um, I, I, I had the pleasure of serving with Anthony Savastano um, and um, on the Parks and Recreation Board, and I recognize the value of these investments to our community. Uh, um, and I, I just see them, the significant economic drivers that they, that they provide, which despite the fact that we do not have a specific report that suggests that, you know, um, the impact to our community, though he did give us some numbers, I sure saw the magnitude of the effect with the 4616 fire and at the Gold King Mine spill when we didn't have tourists coming to enjoy our natural resources. So. I think that, that that was a big indicator of how important these amenities are to our community, truly. Um, and as well, I recognize the importance of our investing in our infrastructure and our police and public safety and our on our buildings around that to make sure that they are efficient, um, efficiently run. So we have some difficult decisions to make next week, and um, I look forward to doing that with this current council and deciding the steps that we're going to take to go forward. Mm -hmm. Councilor Berkey. Uh, I have no particular uh, activities to report on, except I agree with that, that I, I believe the recreation is the DNA of Durango. And I believe that uh, any reduction of funding and the wholesale uh, uh, interference with that, with the dedicated sales taxes that have been established and voted on by the public would be a significant mistake by this council. Uh, or the voters, and maybe we can put it up to the voters, but I think, you know, it would not be supported in the future, because I do think it, you know, when people really, really think about it, that uh, it is one of the most important things as has been documented here tonight, and uh, uh, to this community and the future of this community. So, 
Thank you, sir. Uh, Councillor White? I have um, reserved comments about our options for the future to next okay. week. Okay. Uh, there are a couple of upcoming events that I think are worth mentioning. Uh, the Southwest Colorado uh, Economic Outlook is coming up next Tuesday, the 8th, uh, 8, from 8 to 11 at the Community Concert Hall. Green Business Roundtable is uh, Wednesday at noon. And on looking further ahead, um, Durango Rocks, the uh, Chamber of Commerce Award Ceremony, which I have always found to be really um, an inspiring event, is coming up on the 17th. Uh, that's more, that'll be after our next uh, council meeting, but you need, it's, uh, you need to buy tickets, and if you want to get them, you should probably get them sooner rather than later. All right, thank you. Well, I would like to compliment our snowplow drivers. Um, I was out shoveling at midnight, and a snowplow guy came by. Uh, on New Year's Day, I'm out shoveling, and here comes our wonderful snowplow drivers. So I'm tipping my cap to you, and I appreciate all that you have done for the city of Durango. You know, we've had a lot of snow, more is coming. It's a great winter, and uh, I sure appreciate all the men that are working out there at midnight, one o'clock in the morning. Also, I'd like to remind everyone that CDOT has made a substantial investment in our community on 17th Street, 22nd Street, and 32nd Street. So that's part of what you're seeing, and I think it's always good to remind people that um, CDOT is a great partner with the city of Durango. Ms. Blake, I'd ask you to show a slide. Sometimes the city gets criticized. Oh, you're not doing enough for different populations or underserved populations. So I've asked Ms. Blake to prepare a slide showing exactly how many hundreds of thousands of dollars that the city of Durango sets aside, mm -hmm. there you go, for community support programs. So you may not be able to see it, but I'm gonna read it to you. La Plata Youth Services, $91,500. The Homeless Program, $17,500. Access Health Detox, the building, uh, the services, 150,000. Access Health Acute Treatment Unit, $222,000. Food Tax Rebate Program, 20,000. Utility Refund Program, 8,000. Low Income Transit Pass Programs, 3,000. The Community Support Grant Program, $140,000. The animal shelter, $100,000. This comes to $752,000 that are wisely given by this city council and the budget to um, our community. And um, we also, I'm talking, you wanna talk? I'll talk. You're doing great. Okay, we also have additional support that maybe you're not aware of. I'm gonna explain more about what else the city does. The Volunteers of America Community Shelter up on the hill, the social campus, they get charged $1 a year for that site. And if we, we're all smart enough to know the land's more valuable than that. Uh, Housing Solutions of the Southwest, uh, $1 a year for transitional housing. The Regional Housing Alliance Program, $1 a year. The Southwest uh, Community Connections on the Hilltop House, halfway house, for men and women that are adjudicated through the court systems, they all go and find a job, they all have caseworkers, they are all on the straight and narrow, uh, $1 a year. Mana Soup Kitchen, $1 a year. So when people come to the city council and criticize us for not doing enough, here's our uh, score sheet. I'm always amazed at the, um, sometimes the comments that I hear from people at the podium, and I've asked Ms. Blake to present this. So, um, Ms. Blake is also, I've asked her to talk about the road runner, the transit program. Sometimes we get slammed, you're not doing enough, you take away. Well, there are reasons that we lost money, that's the state, Ms. Blake. Will you uh, talk about the Roadrunner Transit sure. Program? So Durango Transit has received a statewide award through the Colorado Association of Transit Agencies for service coordination with um, Roadrunner Transit. 
And this is the first year that the state's given out a coordination award. And the award was for the coordinated service that Durango Transit has with Roadrunner Transit. So Roadrunner Transit comes in um, from Bayfield and Ignacio into Durango and connects to Durango Transit system within the city of Durango. And when we were forced to reduce services this past year, our staff worked with the staff at Roadrunner Transit to create a program where Durango Transit passes would be valid on the Roadrunner service. And the city of Durango pays Roadrunner Transit $5,000 a year so that those passes can be free. This also helps them make the local match for their transit grant through the state of Colorado. The service runs Monday through Friday from Three Springs to the Transit Center, and the inbound trips leave Three Springs at 6.30 a.m., 7.15 a.m., 9 a.m., 9.05 a.m., 12.30 p.m., 4.55 p.m., and 5.25 p.m., and then they leave the Transit Center at 7.08 a.m., 7.48 a.m., 9.35 a.m., 10.08 a.m., 1.08 p.m., 3.35 p.m., 5.28 p.m., and 6.03 p.m., heading back outbound. Um, this service has been working very well. The ridership numbers are good, and our riders from Three Springs, um, although it is not the 30-minute headways that we previously had, at least it's something. We do hope that in the future we find a sustainable funding source for transit, and we're able to bring back our system to at least what it was, but hopefully the vision that it is in the multimodal master plan. We also have some other exciting news that we're working on with Roadrunner Transit right now. Um, they submit a request to us for some additional funding for local match so that they could use their full award from the state. And they have some other funding partners as well for this, but it's a way for us to provide some service or have a service provided through Roadrunner out the 160 West corridor, which was the other corridor that was cut. So we're thrilled that Roadrunner Transit is happy to partner with us and we can provide a small financial um, stipend, if you will, a small contract with them. That's $10,000. So for a total of $15,000, we're able to work with Roadrunner, partner with them, and get some service from Three Springs and coming this year with the 160 West service that'll help us for the health and human services um, trips specifically out to the tech center, which is what we hear about most frequently. So. Well, thank you so much. I, I believe that the more that we communicate, hey, the more everybody knows. And so I wanted to celebrate with everyone, especially the, the $750,000 that the city puts out for the benefit. Doesn't matter where you come from. If you're in detox, you could be from New Mexico, the county. It's not limited to city residents. The same thing for La Plata Youth Services. So I really appreciate that. And, also, I wanted to remind everyone that we have some new street lamps downtown, and they are fabulous. Um, I've been downtown at many nights, and when I'm driving, I can see those people at the uh, cross who are getting ready to cross the street. And I want everyone to recognize that that's something new in the city of Durango. They're fabulous street lights. So, thank you so much. I think I've covered uh, what I wanted to share with our. Friends and neighbors, thanks so much for tuning in to this year's uh, first city council meeting. And we'll see you on January, I believe, the 15th. Yep. It's a regular Tuesday night. So thank you all. Have a great holiday. Let's shovel some snow. Thank you. <laughs>